now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the pilot episode of A Sea of Spears, our World of Ice and Fire RPG game, uh, hosted on the Shadowcasters Network and brought to you by Green Ronin. Uh, two great tastes that taste great together. Uh, this is our very first in-character episode. Uh, several of you have joined us as we rolled up the house and rolled up some characters. Uh, and today we are rolling into trouble. Uh, so let's get started introducing you all to the young scions uh, of the noble house Nymerian. Uh, and let's do this in status order, starting with our lady heir. Uh, take it away, Felicia. I'm Felicia Zimmerman, and I play Raina Nymerian. Uh, I am the heir and eldest twin of the house. Uh, and Raina is a, a, a prime example of our old Valyrian blood in that she has the silver hair and the amethyst eyes. She's very thin and she's tall. So uh, she definitely has that look, uh, unlike her twin, Bela. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erica Hoffman, and I'm playing Bela Nymerian. I am the just briefly younger twin sister of our house heir. Um, I am a tall, dark-haired, dark eyes, um, tan, well-built, but not like really muscular, just slim and uh, agile. Uh, and these twin uh, ladies of the house uh, are the eldest, um, and they represent kind of the two halves of House Nymerian. Uh, the two of them have been raised together somewhat overprotectively by their grandfather, Lord Makar. Um, and the two have very different physical and also kind of mental types, uh, different flavors of, of royalty and nobility. Uh, Felicia's character, the heir, uh, has always been uh, more mature, more grounded, and a little more aloof uh, and serious-minded, uh, so much so that people used to joke that she was years older uh, than her twin until some growth spurts started to hit in uh, and the increased physicality of the wild, ruinish blood uh, began to more than catch up. Uh, so the two of them are, are undeniable beauties, uh, the pride and future of their house uh, that have been raised to rule and to fight, as is the Dornish custom uh, for women folk. Um, but they also, in a very Westerosi way, uh, the blood is true. Uh, and one of them ended up with that Valyrian split, and one ended up uh, with that wild Rhoynish blood uh, that's much more Nymerian and Dornish. Uh, next in line, uh, in this house uh, is the eldest son. Uh, Robert can't join us this weekend. He's at some convention, I believe. Uh, he'll be here for the next episodes. Uh, but the firstborn son of House Nymerian of Wyvern's Rest is Lucaris Nymerian. Uh, he is of Valyrian blood, uh, but he has taken cares and pains to uh, kind of hide it. Uh, he is, is uh, dyeing his hair to try to stay a little under the radar because he is currently a knight in King's Landing. He finished his squiring to the Master at Arms of the Red Keep there in King's Landing uh, and has been serving as a courtier, just representing the house in the capital for the last few months. Uh, so you guys won't be seeing him uh, until next session when we get there. Uh, but Lucaris uh, Nymerian is a little more worldly than the sisters who've been protected and kept at home. And you guys will all meet Robert next time. So next in line, and the next player and character to meet, uh, is the second son, young Adam. Take it away, Ash. Um, hi, I'm Ash. I'm playing Adam Nymerian, the sort of the, well, the baby of the family. Um, he has been squiring in the north for House Manderley. Um, but that has been cut short uh, as a riding accident has shattered his leg, leaving him unable to continue um, his progress towards being a knight. So it is um, returning to his family with uh, a 
crippled body and broken dreams, really, and trying to recalibrate his trajectory in life and find a new place in the world. Uh, and that wraps up the young scions of House Nymerian, but that does not round out the cast of characters uh, because this young generation of nobles uh, is going to be joined on their adventures, trials, tribulations, and misadventures uh, by a bastard ward of the Riverlands. Who is that, Kevin? Hi, I'm Kevin Zarnke, and I'll be playing the part of Vannon Rivers, a bastard of the Riverlands and of House Blackwood. He stands much like the sword he wields, long, lean, a bastard. Uh, he has dreams of... <laughs> he has dreams of ascending to some kind of prominence, almost despite his apparent father, Lord Blackwood. Uh, aside from that, he dreams of tourneys, but before that, and truthfully still during, he really appreciates scholarly pursuits. This has left him just a little lacking in the arts of uh, manipulating people in politics. But it's left him with a strong sword arm, an incredible faculty with animals, and not a little bit of book learning. Uh, and that wraps up our... Uh, well, I, uh, oh, go I, ahead. I, I forgot to give a brief description of Adam. Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, he's sort of... Um, black, kind of lanky, sweet-faced 15-year-old with the, kind of, the, the Valyrian kind of uh, pale blonde hair, but with the dark eyes of uh, is Dornish blood. Uh, so right. I was tickled with the the way our bloodlines fell together, because it feels very George R R Martiny, um, where those physical traits kind of mix and mingle uh, in perhaps unrealistic ways, uh, but symbolic ways. So it's kind of fun. Uh, that rounds out our cast of player characters. Uh, last and not least, uh, I'm the GM, and I get to play everyone else. Uh, so. Uh, bear with me as I occasionally dabble in funny accents and that sort of thing, switching from character to character instead of just continuing my lifelong LARP as Robert Baratheon. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we have one last thing to introduce uh, before the game really gets started after this brief introduction of, of players and characters, uh, and that's introducing the widget that you guys all see in the top left-hand corner of your screen which is your very own opportunity to claim the Iron Throne uh, by sending out likes and subscribes uh, and all the rest of those goodies. Uh, you as viewers uh, can seize the Iron Throne yourself. On other streams, the HP stands for hit points. Here it stands for horsepower uh, because <laughs> the hit points remaining are how many knights the king has to defend the throne with. Uh, and as the stream boss is defeated uh, and King's Landing runs out of knights with which to defend itself, uh, you are able to invade and claim the throne. Um, whenever the Iron Throne is claimed, one player character that has spent a destiny point can refresh that destiny point. Um, and it can go to an NPC instead, if you prefer, uh, oh, Throne Caesar. But we think normally it's going to be trying to help out the players. Um, and then whoever claims the Iron Throne and holds it at the end of a stream uh, will get to chat with me briefly. Uh, and as the reigning king or queen of the Andals and the First Men, Defender of the Realm, Protector of the Kingdom, etc., uh, etc., et you can grant a boon to a noble house of your choosing. That can be House Nymerian of Wyvern's Rest. But if you start to like some NPCs and you start to get interested in their plots and schemes and entanglements, mm -hmm. uh, you can grant a boon to a different house. Uh, so that's going to be up to whoever claims the Iron Throne uh, at the end of an episode. Uh, and we're going to find a way to work that little boon in uh, in the next episode whenever possible. So you'll get some fairly immediate gratification. The very next time you watch, uh, you can see... Uh, schemes twisting and turning. Um, but that destiny point refresh uh, is going to encourage the players to kind of go big, keep things exciting, spend their destiny points to keep the dice going hot, uh, and then hopefully you guys will reward them. And if you don't, 
Uh, and if the, the Iron Throne gets seized and you decide to reward NPCs instead and keep their rivals going, then it's just going to feel that much more like you're actually reading a Song of Ice and Fire book because bad things are going to happen to good people. Uh, and that's the most Westerosi thing of all. When the book uh, finally comes out. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so, with the stream boss also introduced, uh, I'm going to set the stage and we're going to kick things off uh, and get rolling in character. Uh, everyone is currently assembled at Wyvern's Rest, uh, which, as you may recall from a few sessions ago, uh, is the castle of House Nymerian. Uh, it is carved out of the red stones of the Red Mountains uh, and lies at a crucial juncture along the Stoneway. Uh, which is a mountain pass slash road. It's actually like paved and very cleared in, in many long stretches. Um, that is the kind of arterial line from the Stormlands into Dorne. Uh, the colloquial name for the Stoneway is the Boneway because so many wars have been fought in it. So many armies have been ambushed here uh, over the years. Um, over the generations, o over the millennium, uh, that armies have just been left to rot on the side of the road. There's tangles of skeletons to this day uh, in certain key areas. Uh, if if the, the quarrelsome Dornish refused to even let the Stormlands recover their dead, uh, it's just been left for the vultures in the sun. Uh, so uh, it's a harsh place, but it is a place of, of prominence and wealth and prosperity to House Nymerian, uh, founded by your grandfather's grandfather uh, during the reign of King Darren the Good, when the Valyrian and the Roinar bloodlines were joined uh, by uh, House uh, Nimros Martell being married into the Valyrian line of Targaryen kings, uh, a byblow of that relationship. What's this house being formed, being founded, and being given a very important spot along the Stoneway? Uh, something uh, of a safe haven, uh, an asylum or an oasis, if you will. Uh, they are the overseers, along with their sworn banner houses, of a lush green valley uh, and a place where streams and rivers uh, pour down through their bannermen's lands and into the Sea of Dorne. Uh, so the lands under their control actually stretch to the coastline uh, from the, the Stoneway all the way to the, the Sea of Dorne. Uh, it's an important spot about halfway down. Um, and they're an important house because of it. Uh, everyone has gathered here recently uh, and largely to celebrate. Uh, they recently had a, a reasonably uh, important victory over some of the bandits that perpetually plague the lands of your bannermen, uh, particularly the wooded regions that are overseen by your Aunt Elia, uh, the, the Lady Knight of House Sandstorm. Um, she and her troops are much less mobile uh, than your cavalry, which are largely supplied by a different bannermen. And the woods make it difficult for even cavalry patrols to always find their prey. Uh, but there was a recent skirmish with these bandits uh, that saw the, the twin ladies of, of House Nymerian uh, exposed uh, to threat, perhaps through their own hubris, perhaps because they are just fine horses uh, with fine riders atop them. Uh, but they raced a bit away from the cavalry patrol in their, their urgency to attack the foe and cleanse their land and uh, the lady heir's horse uh, fell to an arrow and a broken leg uh, and sadly had to be put down. Uh, her twin rushed to fight back to back uh, and the two of them were encircled, uh, but the remainder of the cavalry arrived uh, with the bastard ward uh, at the, the lead uh, of that charge. Um, so the celebration tonight is not just over a victory of a few dozen bandits, uh, but in recognition of the young Riverlander's courage, uh, tenacity, and, and bravery, uh, and the fact that he may very well have saved the, the lives of, of your brash uh, and dedicated uh, young leaders. Um, the other cause for celebration uh, is that young Adam has returned to you perhaps not completely hale and hearthy, uh, or hale and healthy, 
Um, but he made the journey safely. Uh, he arrived just yesterday uh, as that bedraggled patrol was returning. Um, and a trip from the north is no small feat, uh, especially if you're already recovering from a grievous injury. So everyone was already worried about Adam, uh, but uh, he made it here uh, last night, uh, just before dusk or just after dusk. Um, and it's good to see him home again. It's good that he's safe. Uh, it's it's good that he is is in one piece, even if that piece is a little bit twisted uh, around one leg and a little bit limpy. Um, he's comparatively safe, and that's not nothing. Uh, and then, uh, as if on cue, because you heard there was a celebration, you're going to be joined by a few NPCs uh, that came rolling in a few hours after dawn today. Uh, and that is Will of the Bells, uh, a hedge knight, um, that if he were less welcome, you would say plagues this house, because he comes by every now and then, normally when he needs a place to stay, and to rest up and heal. Uh, Sir Will, or Wooly Will, because he took an oath about 15 years ago to not shave his beard or cut his hair, uh, is a, a big slope-shouldered mountain of a man with this terrifically wild mane and this tangled beard. Uh, kind of looks like Brendan Gleeson, that actor, uh, especially in his role in Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, and you guys see him normally every two or three years. He kind of cycles through the region. It's been about five years since his last visit, though. Uh, and you almost have trouble recognizing him because that tremendous tangled mass of hair isn't that bright Riverlander red shot through with white anymore. Uh, it's white with a few streaks of red. Uh, so his, his hair is like a... Uh, a copper mine that is running dry. There's a few streaks of, of weak red, a kind of rustish red in it. Uh, and his shoulders are more sloped than you remember. Uh, and you remember him as this, this giant. He was larger than the strong cider, your master at arms. Uh, he was larger than Sir Adam Bridington, your master of horse. Um, it's just this huge bear of a man that's very much not built like uh, a Nymerian. He's not built like a Dornishman or, or a Valyrian. He was this huge kind of round guy. Uh, and he's still pretty huge and still pretty round, but, but he's getting much older. Uh, so it takes you a moment to recognize him. It also takes you a moment to recognize the driver of the wagon, because that's not just his boy, Oris, anymore. Uh, Oris is a looming uh, tall drink of water. Uh, with these huge, broad shoulders. Uh, you all remember him, because he's a few years younger than you, uh, as kind of this scrawny kid that was very serious about training at arms and not much else. He could read a little bit, but he didn't have your culture. He certainly didn't have your status. He's just Oris. Didn't even have a last name. Uh, it was just Oris, the Hedge Knight's boy. Uh, well, Oris is about 6'6 six, six now. Uh, and while he's not quite as shaggy uh, as uh, Sir Will, uh, he's got shoulder length hair that's just black as night. He's got uh, stubble on and he's got a kind of a brooding look on his face now, which you think might be related to the <laughs> clear injuries uh, that Wooly Will has. Will is not riding on his horse for maybe the first time you've ever seen. Uh, he's laid up in the side of their wagon uh, oh, no. with his arm up in a sling uh, and one big tree trunk leg is like stretched out the side of the wagon with splints on it um, and and it, his his huge mane of hair is partially kind of matted in place uh, by bandages wound around his head so he's not looming as large as you remember from 10 years ago of course uh, but he also just looks kind of faded and worn out in comparison. But they must have heard that there's a feast uh, because here the hedge knights come. They're like, hey, free food. We've never been refused at Wyvern's Rest. Uh, and it looks like they never will be. 
uh, because as the entire keep and castle is assembled here in the square, and most of you are wearing your finest, Grandfather Maycar found a spot for Wooly Will and for Surly Oris. Uh, and they're kind of towards the back, uh, but they're still there where, you know, the other loyal house retainers and stuff should be, where your sworn knights are. Uh, Aunt Elia is here. Uh, she rode up from Sandstorm uh, first to make sure that that patrol was fine, and then she looked a little disappointed and put her arrows back in their quiver. Uh, but then... Uh, because she wanted to celebrate this momentous occasion. Sir Adam Bridington uh, is here. Um, he is the master of horse uh, of your house. He's another grizzled old knight. He's a much leaner, lankier build. Uh, I would say more of a Liam Neeson build, but I'm a little down on Liam Neeson lately, but still that body type. Uh, long and lean and fit for his age, uh, but not that huge mountain of a man. Uh, and he also brought with him his loyal septum, uh, uh, Jim, uh, who looks a lot like James Purifoy. Uh, he himself could certainly be a knight instead of a septum. Um, and he stays in the saddle uh, with Sir Adam Bridington. They ride patrols together, uh, even at their age. So all these uh, loyal retainers are here. Uh, everyone is wearing their finest uh, everyone's cleaned up. Uh, the bathhouses were extra busy uh, last night and today. First, so that the dusty, bloody patrol could get cleaned up, but also so everyone could get ready. Um, this is a proper feast uh, and a celebration of Adam's return uh, and of Vannon's ascension. Uh, so what's everybody wearing and where are you standing in the square as this ceremony is being prepared? I stand next to Grandfather, as is correct. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since this is a formal encounter, I will be wearing uh, a simple light gown, uh, because it is warm, in <laughs> <laughs> uh, shades of uh, wine uh, and cream. With the simple, just just a simple silken head wrap once with the end. All right, got a little bit choppy there at the end, but I think I've got the mental image, and I think it looks dope. How is your sister looking? <laughs> the other half of your yin and yang. Magnificent, if I do say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> she does. <laughs> so I have on a, a similarly um, light dress, but mine's uh, colored with yellows of the sun and silvers and golds. Um, and uh, I'm going to be standing uh, around Aunt Elia and, you know, conversing a little bit about some of the patrols, what we found, maybe some, some planning for... Um, Wanted to follow up in that region um, for additional patrols, something like that. Sure. Uh, Aunt Elia, for her part, uh, is also definitely this kind of classic uh, Dornish look. Uh, if anybody has seen commercials or much less played uh, the recent Assassin's Creed game, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, uh, they have male and female uh, protagonist options. Uh, and the female protagonist is just as tall and buff as the male protagonist because they didn't want to shoot all the cutscenes twice. Uh, but uh, Cassandra from Assassin's Creed Odyssey uh, is this looming, tall, broad-shouldered Mediterranean woman uh, with her hair in kind of a simple, kind of single-plated braid. Uh, and that's basically what Aunt Elia looks like. Um, she's got those kind of dusky Dornish hues, kind of olive-hued skin and that sort of thing. Uh, but she's also got that very powerful upper body of, of a lifelong archer. Uh, she's been shooting longbows and stuff longer, literally, longer than you all have been alive. Uh, and she's just got like that, that Olympian build going in the upper body. Um, and she's more than happy to talk troop placements with you. Um, and, you know, she shares, uh, there's a simultaneous 
camp, attack at a different camp yesterday. Uh, she and her men didn't even use their blades. They just, you know, shot him at range. Um, and, and she's talking about that and then where they suspect some other camps might be. And so she's more than happy to sit and talk uh, talk warfare uh, with you. Uh, Grandpa Makar, uh, just to describe his garb real quick, uh, he is actually wearing um, his gambeson, his, his light kind of padded armor. Um, everyone has seen on the Game of Thrones show that kind of leather jacket that Jamie Lannister wears. That's actually kind of their version of that padded gambeson armor. Um, and uh, Grandpa Makar is wearing his of that. Uh, it's kind of a steely gray, that gray color that is used throughout the house. That's not quite a silver, um, but he's, he's it's wearing that color. But then he also has on uh, kind of a sash uh, across one shoulder and then down to his hip. That's this like you know streak of wine red from the rest of of the house crest, and every little button and fitting and belt buckle. And every piece of metal that he's wearing is gold. Uh, so he's definitely got the house colors on uh, and in kind of a formal look, but with an appropriately martial bent. Uh, and he's wearing his sword belt and has his sword uh, at his hip uh, because a knighting is, is a ceremony, uh, but it's still definitely a martial affair. Uh, uh, Grandpa Makar, by the way, Lord Makar, uh, is played by Christopher Plummer that actor so he's got that just straight up dignified white hair those sharp features uh so they're serious features but occasionally so with a, a glint of mischief uh in his eyes when the mood strikes him uh so lord makar is, is looking very regal uh and the white hair and dark colors he knows what he's doing he knows how to dress uh in, in a fancy pantsy uh fashionable way uh what about the youngster of our family uh, where's Adam, and how does he look? Um, right, well, Adam has been in the north since he was eight years old, so is not used to this hot Darnish weather at all. He is dying of the heat. Um, so has dressed as lightly as possible in the kind of Darnish style with the the kind of the sort of wrapped silk robe over, like, breeches and boots rather than wearing leathers um, just so that he can stay conscious um, <laughs> and, and I mean, he uh, he likes kind of blues and greens so he'll have gone with a kind of mixture of those kind of colours of the sea um, that uh, kind of complements his pale complexion and um I think initially, with Willie Will turning up in a bit of a state, he'll have made a massive fuss of him, um, worried about the old family friend, um, but been um, very shy around his son, who has transformed enormously since he last saw him, and kind of, uh, I don't know this strange, intriguing person, I'm going to avoid them. Ah! Um, <laughs> uh, but when Adam Bridenton shows up, this is the that's the man that he's he looked up to the most uh before he left um so we'll have stuck close to him trying to reconnect uh woolly will 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 make a big joke about uh using you as a crutch only in the direst of emergencies because he's afraid he'd break your lad uh and he probably would uh, even if his leg was still working, if he was to lean on you, that mass would still be there. Uh, Sir Adam, meanwhile, um, actually uh, tears up just a hair um, and then hides it with a, a cough. Oh, damn, still not used to this dust down here. He's lived in Dorn for like 20 years. Uh, you know, but, but he'll uh, kind of hide it and he'll go, oh, what what some terrible northern pony do to your leg? I told your grandfather. I couldn't train him in ice. Shouldn't be sending him up to those snowy mountains. And look, they went oh. and broke you while I wasn't there. I'm sorry, lad. I'm sorry. Oh, you have nothing to be sorry for. It, it could have happened to anyone. It was, you know, it was just an accident. It, it wasn't anyone's fault. Certainly not yours. 
if, 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 if anything, the reason um the, the reason I'm still alive is because of how well you trained me. I I only got injured because of how well I was trained. She lost a horse yesterday. He points uh, over at uh, <laughs> Rena. And you almost lost a leg to a horse. If you lot keep this up. No one will have to worry about trying to find me a bride and heir. Bridington lands will be dissolved. They'll make a horse master of horse. And just, well, I'm just glad you're okay, lad. And he'll reach out and tousle your hair. And they'll be like, dust, 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 Dornish winds. And then <laughs> springtime, it's springtime. Um, and that brings us uh, to Vannon. Uh, who is the reason for the season, or at least the reast for the feast. Uh, so, uh, Vannon, how are you dressed up? Uh, Vannon has gotten used to the heat in all this time. He never seems to tan, even under the Dornish sun, so he's as pale as ever, offset by dark hair with extremely premature white streaks in it, considering he's only 20. Um... He's uh, clad in extremely dark red uh, undershirt and very dark gray, like, slacks, overshirt, high riding boots. He's cleaned up a lot, um, especially considering the perpetual dust of the road, which clings to him usually. So uh, he's not standing abreast with the siblings. He begrudgingly knows his place and is instead behind them. Which probably works because he's fairly tall compared to everybody. Uh, and, you know, while everyone is still kind of getting together, you're able to be wherever you want. You're all just kind of milling around and socializing at this point. He's um, a bastard. He's angsty. Sure. Um, and that said, however, uh, everyone seems to be here. Uh, Wild Wooly. Uh, is wearing his finery such as it is, uh, which to say his cleanest tabard is tossed on over his usual attire. Uh, the looming uh, young Oris um, actually has garb that's halfway between a traveler's garb and a peasant's garb. Uh, like one costs two silver and one costs four, and he spent three. Right? So it's like good quality <laughs> peasant garb. Uh, he has been growing like crazy. Like I said, he's basically unrecognizable. Um, and even what he's wearing, uh, which doesn't look all that dusty from the road or need mending or whatever, uh, so it's probably fairly new, like, it still looks a little bit short on him already. Uh, so it looks like he's definitely still still growing. Um, but it's clean. They, they both went out of their way. They, they both bathed after they arrived. Uh, along with the other retainers and small Ooh, that are, yeah, that's a big deal. It gets it out of the way for this year. I mean, they yeah, use yearly bath, whether you need it or yeah. not. Yeah, every year. Um, but yeah, so they've done what they can to clean up. Uh, Oris has his his uh, pitch black hair pulled back in a simple ponytail, um, which is about as close as he's going to come to combing it for you. Because Wooly Will isn't big on the grooming. Uh, he didn't teach him much about combing and trimming. Um, but, uh, yeah, so they cleaned up as much as they could. Uh, but uh, Sir Adam is in his finest. You know, he's been a knight for decades. He knows how to clean up for this sort of thing. Uh, the strong cider, uh, the master at arms here at the keep, uh, is in his armor that has been raised to a well-oiled gleam um, and, and he doesn't often wear his his full armor because he's in Dorn. Um, but he's he's actually in his rattling plate mail for this, uh, and it's polished to a, a high shine. Um, and and he wants to you know he's looking his best. Um, and everyone is together. Um, uh, the maester goes puttering off uh, upstairs, um, mentioning a, nothing of particular import or clarity he's not quite as old as maester Pycelle from the show but he has honorably served grandfather Makar for quite some time we will put it politely that way uh so he is sharp as a whip but not always uh using his outside voice uh, at times <laughs> he's given it just muttering to himself and and walking off 
to write something down. And it's up to us whatever. to have heard what he said. <laughs> yeah, like he's like, I clearly told you. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, an old man being befuddled or whatever. It's just volume issues happen as you get on in years. So everyone's here, um, but he goes, he goes puttering off. Uh, but Lord Makar doesn't seem off-put uh, by the maester leaving. Uh, and instead, with the clarity of, of a, a trumpet fanfare or the stamping of royal heralds or the shouted orders of an officer over a battlefield filled with screams, Lord Makar simply clears his throat. Uh, and here, in Wyvern's Rest, that sound carries and silences everything else. Uh, so it's just a... <clears throat> and, and everybody stops <laughs> and kind of turns and looks towards him. Uh, and it's just, you know, that kind of aced status role um, that everyone was, oh, gee, okay, I guess we're getting started. Uh, so he clears his throat, uh, and that gives everyone a chance to kind of part a little bit. Uh, the siblings part from around you, uh, Vannon, in a way that you're not used to. You're not being told to go somewhere. Uh, instead, it looks like House Nymerian uh, subtly arranged themselves so that you would be on the X, as it were, when the time came. Uh, and they just kind of part uh, and, and are flanking you in positions of honor uh, as Lord Makar uh, stands in front of you with those two feet going down um, as surely as the feet of the Titan of Bravos. Like, he stands where he means to stand. That's where he's going to stay. Wherever he stands is the Lordship of Wyvern's Rest. Right? So there's an air of finality as he puts his feet down. Uh, and then he raises his voice just enough to be clear uh, to the, the farthest uh, viewers. Uh, and he says, Vainin Rivers, kneel. Drop to one knee. On the outside, cool as a cumber, cucumber. On the inside, oh my god, 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 oh my god. This time yesterday, the pride and future of House Nymerian was put in peril by reckless courage and the brigandry of those that stubbornly plague the Red Mountains of Dorne. You were there for them. As your Lord Father was there for the Loyalist cause a generation ago, you spilled blood and risked your life out of loyalty just a day hence. And so, and he reaches down uh, and draws his sword uh, with this measured calmness um, that is clearly like a, it's a ceremonial drawing um, and and it's a good sized sword like it's a it's a proper you know long sword um, but he holds it steady as a rock uh, and there's no doubt in your mind that it's exactly where he wants it to be uh, as he lowers it and and touches one shoulder and it just barely brushes you uh, doesn't disturb your hair or your ear, and it's just steady and straight, uh, just like his voice, uh, as those piercing violet Targaryen eyes stare straight at you. Uh, and he says, in the name of the warrior, I charge you to be brave and true. In the name of the mother, I charge you to defend the young and innocent. In the name of the maid, I charge you to protect all women. In the name of the smith, I charge you to finish what you start. And in the name of the crone, I charge you to light the path for others. Knights must be beacons. And the sword lifts, and it goes up and over, and it taps your opposite shoulder. And he says, Rise, a knight! Sir Vannon Rivers. And the sword is wavering just a little bit as it gets done. Uh, and, and you are all close enough 
that you can see standing this straight and tall and proud and holding four feet of steel at arm's length. It's taking a toll on him, but you know that if all of you were ten more feet away, you wouldn't have any idea. Uh, but you can see him wobbling just a little bit, um, and and he, you know, reverses the blade so that it's out of the way, um, and he holds a hand out, not to help Vannon up, uh, but to offer him a handshake as he rises on his own. I take the hand. Ah, no! <laughs> take the hand. Shake as I rise. I shall not fail you. I do not doubt it, sir. Uh, and then he gives a, a little nod and kind of gestures towards the crowd for you to turn uh, and soak in the, the accolade. I'm not quite sheepish, but... Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it is also not exactly the natural habitat of a bastard and ward. Um, but there's no denying it. Uh, certainly all the, the landed knights uh, and loyal retainers are, are whooping and hollering in as much as etiquette allows them to. Uh, the strong cider and Sir Adam are somewhat reserved and formal, being knights raised in the Reach and the Veil. Um, Aunt Elia don't give a fuck. She's a bastard from Dorne. So she's whooping and hollering and, and <laughs> flexing a little bit as she pumps a fist in the air. Um, you're, you're pretty sure that Wooly Will would be clapping if he didn't have a broken arm. So instead, one of those giant ham hands, he's just slapping it violently on his belly. Uh, so his whole body is <laughs> jiggling and rolling as he hoops and hollers uh, as though he had a part in this at all. Um, what is our response uh, from the, the scions of House Nymerian? We start the cheer. Sir Vanny. <laughs> Sir Vanny. Sir Vanny! Yeah, Sir Vanny. All I need yeah. is a last name. Oh, you you have one. It's Rivers. <laughs> you, you don't get to forget that. <laughs> uh, but he still just introduces you as Sir Van. Um, so, uh, with a gesture <clears throat> that looks like welcoming pride to the future, uh, Lord Makar holds a, an arm out to, ge to gesture his air a little closer, uh, and it looks like a warm hand on your shoulder, but you can feel that he's leaning on you a little more than he used to, uh, a little more than he did uh, at other nightings or similar ceremonies when you've all been arrayed like this. Um, so standing and, and projecting just the right amount for his voice to ring just a little bit in the keep. Um, he's still got it, uh, but it's it's taking a little bit of a toll on him uh, these times. Uh, but he does also give you uh, a loving squeeze on the shoulder like, like, look at what our house is doing. Look at what we have done. Look at this array of, of retainers and sworn swords and landed knights. Uh, and these will all be yours someday, my girl. Type of, like, yeah, look, we're going to be all right. Um, and then you all hear uh, a soft metallic clanking noise. Uh, and the maester comes shuffling back quickly enough that his maester's chain uh, is, is rattling. Uh, and that used to be the giveaway when you had lessons you wanted to avoid uh, if he was scurrying after you, uh, perhaps, for instance, shouting Bela's name uh, and <laughs> calling her back to force her to sit down and once again memorize uh -huh. the Targaryen family tree. Oh, when he is agitated, he clanks when he walks. No. When he's not agitated, it's just this kind of scuffle of, of slippers on, on stone. Uh, but when something is important or, or he's in a rush, you know, that, that chain uh, kind of jangles him. So everybody, you know, you guys look up for a different reason than everyone else. Uh, you're used to going, oh, shit, math, and, and like rough, <laughs> off. But um, he, you know, this, this brown-robed uh, shadow kind of scurries up. Uh, Vaynen is 
uh, or Vannon, sorry, uh, is absorbed in a, an army of pats on the back uh, and a bear hug from Aunt Elia uh, that leaves you feeling funny in your tingly bits and also maybe hurts your ribs because uh, she is crazy strong. Uh, and, uh, is this uh, what sex <laughs> is? <laughs> it's like, no, that's how bastards have it. Um, but yeah, so this big unabashed oh hug from her um, and, uh, you know, Sandy Rivers. Sw- <laughs> yeah, there you go. And uh, a swat on the back from the strong cider, uh, who is normally the one that's taught you to fight. You know, so he's proud, uh, kind of a, a father when their son does well in a, a little league game type of vibe. You know, it's like, I taught him how to do that thing, you know. Um, so uh, everyone's cheering and clapping and all that. But the young nobles are there uh, next to Lord Makar uh, as uh, your maester reaches out with a, a, an age-spotted hand uh, and, and unnecessarily leans in and says, a, a raven came, my lord. Um, and grandfather has on his serious lord face, which is his, his default features. Um, but you notice there's a little bit of a hardening around the eyes uh, as he I reads it. I give him a squint. <laughs> um, and, and he, you know, leans over and gives kind of a polite nod um, to uh, Maester Patrick. Um who shuffles off um, and then Lord Makar gestures uh, and the house page uh, runs up. It's a, a nephew of the strong cider uh, and he leans over to the boy for a moment. The lad scurries off uh, and then he turns to you, uh, his heir, Reyna. He says, bring the children and Sir Vannon. And Sir Willem of the Bells, his boy too, let us be off to the Solar. Have him meet thee there shortly. Shortly is Lord Make Our Talk for, not now. like super urgently, but it better not be too long either. Um, and then he turns uh, and strides away uh, with renewed purpose. Of course, Grandfather. Turn around. <laughs> Look at Bela. Did you hear that? <laughs> what? Yeah, it's it's great, Sir Vannon. Mm. <laughs> Grandfather wants us in the solar. Mm, shortly. What for? Sh- oh, shortly. <laughs> we received yeah. a raven. And yeah, Adam, you mm-hmm. too. <laughs> Well, uh, I do, do, do you know what it said? I do not. Uh, I was not close enough to read over his shoulder. <laughs> I see. Uh, Grandfather wants us to gather in his solar shortly. Oh, all right. Um, well, we'll be... uh, Some private celebrations, perhaps? Sure. <laughs> that will help us get us there quick more quickly than yes. <laughs> right, well um will we go now? Um yes, well sure. say good say your goodbyes, uh but we'll we'll rejoin the party later. Right. People are not yeah. going to be rushing away. There's a feast. Yeah, the, the you guys know the par the party's going to last. Uh, like it'll it'll be fine. This is Dorn. It is yeah. known. Um. Yeah, I, like since um, but kind of Rena is charged with kind of rounding everyone up. Um, Adam will be kind of free to just sort of excuse himself and you know make the way up. Uh. I will fetch Sir Vannon from his crowd of admirers <laughs> with a hand on his arm. Pardon me, everyone. I must borrow our star of the evening. <laughs> Is all well? 
as far as I'm aware, uh, Grandfather wishes to see us in the Solar shortly. We can go now. Excellent. I will... Uh, I, I still need to speak to uh, Sir Will, so I will be right behind you. Make my way to the Solar. Mm -hmm. I will go to Will of the Bells, where he is uh, propped up. Sir Will is balancing precariously but enthusiastically on one leg, uh, using his one good arm on the banquet table. Uh, so he's got that giant ham-sized hand, uh, and he's got a plate that he puts down and then scoops like a handful of stuff uh, off of a platter and onto his plate, and then he hops... Uh, threateningly uh, a little bit down the table <laughs> like he is going to knock over so much stuff you guys uh, but he hops down and then slides his plate down and then grabs himself another you know armful of meat pies uh, he's over there uh, Oris is brooding not far away just Sir Will will you just let me Sir Will I can Sir Will I've got two hands so well, just let me. And he goes, I got it, boy. I can feed myself. And then he almost falls over, gesticulating at Oris because he has one arm and one leg. And uh, so, yeah, that's the that's the status quo uh, that you walk up on. Push to talk. I will tap Sir Will on the shoulder. Eh? Oh, <laughs> Vrena, look at you. Uh, dude, not yes, here for a fruit tart and he tries to offer you a plate I didn't mean to take the last one I, th I think the boy did it <laughs> Sir Will if you choose to have that tart that is your tart however my grandfather seeks you to join us in his solar the solar there's stairs mm. Fine, fine. I'll not refuse our host, of course. Uh, boy, carry the food. What are you doing? I've got one arm and one leg. Damn it, squire, help your knight. Uh, and he goes shuffling off uh, like a mountain on the roll. I smile at Oris. <laughs> Oris does not smile back. Uh, That's he, why. He goes, those huge shoulders of his are like slumped and like god damn it this is my life uh it, that that just i fucking told him uh and he grabs that plate and he goes off uh staying a few steps behind um okay and they head up to the solar children sir will or oh, that was it right yeah and, and, and yeah so you've got everybody uh so we will bweep up to the solar. Uh, the solar of a proper castle like this uh, is basically the Lord's office. Uh, it's where he spends his days and in Lord Makar's case, all too often his nights. Uh, he's got a huge desk um, that is, uh, it's propped up on sturdy wooden legs, uh, but it's a smooth slab of, of red stone uh, like what they used to create the keep itself. Uh, and it's been, you know, worn and polished over the, the century plus uh, a hair that this house has been. But at the same time that they were carving these the, the, the castle out, uh, they, they gave him this huge slab of, of a desk. Uh, and it perpetually has maps and, and letters and letters he's writing uh, and half-written letters and half you know, uh, half burned letters. Uh, and, and it's, you know, a little brazier, uh, brazier for, for burning stuff. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, the different thing. I knew what I meant. <laughs> that's, that's how it's you pronounced. Can, you can burn yeah. a brazier in a brazier. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he's got all that. He's got the sealing wax um, and the actual seal, uh, which is, you know, a little kind of uh, stylus type of thing about this long. Uh, it's mimicked in the seal ring, the signet ring. You also have a signet ring, uh, Reyna. Um, but it's just got stuff all over it. Uh, a couple of of empty dishes, uh, because he tends to stay here and work uh, through the night instead of eating like he should. All kinds of stuff like that. Um, 
but we're going to skip up to there. Um, the uh, kind of a love seat sized chair is completely consumed by Wooly Will. Um, it's it's meant for multiple people to sit on or for someone to sit and have maps and stuff ready. And instead, it's just him and his his mass. Uh, and Oris is kind of brooding in a corner near the door because, like, nobody told him to leave, but he assumed he was supposed to after he carried up Wooly Will's stuff. Um, but he just also looks kind of ready to bolt. Like, I don't go in Solars. Uh, but uh, he's... Just kind of waiting there near the door. Um, and the rest of you are arrayed in usual spots. Uh, there are a few stools uh, that are able to be pulled out kind of behind the desk uh, for the twins to sit at. Um, so, uh, everyone is together, uh, and Grandfather takes out the cloth uh, from the it's raven. And uh, he reads it without looking at it again. Uh, and he says, to the noble houses of Westeros, and he kind of stares off into the distance, his fingers are steepled in thought. Greetings in the name of King Robert Baratheon. His Royal Highness has declared attorney shall be held in honor of the name day of the Princess Marcella on the fields of King's Landing to begin two weeks hence. All vassals to the crown are invited to attend and do honor to their names. Uh, and then he gives it a little kind of negligent brush uh, towards Reyna. And, and even at arm's length, you can see there's a second, much bolder, much sloppier hand that is scrawled onto the bottom half of it. It says, especially you Nymerians. I was reminded of your existence by the ascension of Sir Lucaris. I oh, will dang it, Luke. Uh, and then... What did he do now? The dag's head seal uh, of Robert Baratheon. Uh, you received word a few months ago that your brother Lucaris was knighted. Uh, he was knighted by the knight he served, the master at arms of the Red Keep. Uh... Uh, a knight of Spotswood, uh, Sir Santagar. Uh, and it's a joyous occasion, but it seems like maybe him being knighted kind of got Robert's eye. Like, Robert wasn't able to just ignore him as a squire. Robert must have just noticed uh, when he got knighted. Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, the rider on this very polite invitation uh, is written in a bold and sloppy hand, calling out your house to attend. Dang it, Bobby. I suppose on the bright side, he didn't put this on everyone's invitation. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, one can only hope. What well, one would hope he had more decorum than that. Uh, grandfather lifts a skeptical eyebrow, as he often does when discussing the decorum, or indeed the royalty, uh, of Lord Robert or King Robert Baratheon. Um, but he keeps his fingers steepled and kind of leans back in his chair. And says, there is no denying this invitation. I am sorry, my sweet daughters. He often calls you that instead of granddaughters. I cannot keep you from him any longer. You must attend. Will, you are certainly not. But uh, we have no squire, as it would seem we've misplaced ours and replaced him with a knight. Might we borrow young Oris for a, a month or two? Uh, out of character, you guys know it's it's basically going to take you the two weeks to get there. Like, that's kind of a dick move on Robert's part. Uh, you get the feeling that uh, that this probably was an invitation that was held and sent out to you a little bit later. Um, but it's going to take you most of that time to get there. You know the tourney itself is going to last at least a week. Uh, tourneys are grand affairs. So you're probably looking at 
you know, a little over a month uh, to get there, get back. So, um, Will, in an uncharacteristic move, uh, has stopped just like shoveling food into his mouth uh, and then occasionally carelessly spitting some of the bones back out onto his plate. Uh, and he's giving your grandfather a long and serious look. Uh, Wooly Will is a man <clears throat> that has never been refused at Wyvern's Rest. But he's a man that hasn't often been welcomed by Lord Makar. Uh, Lord Makar tends to be very stiff and formal with him, even for Lord Makar. Uh, the other knights, Sir Adam Bridington uh, and the Stromsider, have been very respectful uh, to Wooly Will over the years. Almost deferential. Uh, if knights are training and squires are training, uh, Wooly Will will correct the Strongsider. Uh, like, not loudly, not calling him on it, um, but like, you'll see him kind of shake his head, and then the Strongsider will like change his instruction or whatever. Like, that's not normal for the Master. Like, so he's clearly very respected by the other knights and by your grandfather, but your grandfather clearly seems to kind of not like him or maybe kind of hold some sort of grudge against him. But this look that they're sharing uh, is a clear kind of mutual respect. We've talked about this before. You know, uh, it's it's not a just a polite request. It's also not a lordly order. He seems to honestly be asking Will, like, are you on board? Um, and, and Will gives him a long look uh, and then his big bushy eyebrows uh, kind of turn and he gives Oris a look and he goes, I, I think the boy's ready. I'll talk to him tonight. Uh, and then he sits back and his plate of food, he kind of rests it on his belly, which is why he's been growing as chubby as he has because he knew he might be down an arm someday, and that way he could keep a food ready. But he stops eating. Like, he looks like he's overcome by a serious uh, weight. Uh, and it looks like his shoulders have slumped uh, a little bit more. At that uh, note of ascent, Grandfather sits up straighter, though. Uh, like, something new has started. Um, he goes, yes. You'll all be leaving in the morning. We'll speak then. Go. Uh, enjoy your feast, Sir Vannon. Uh, the rest of you, enjoy the feast also. Drink deep. Rest well. Meet me in the solar after you break your fasts. I have work to do. Uh, and he just looks down at his letters and gets busy writing stuff. Uh, respectfully, so, and go. Uh, you're able to have a short meeting in the hallway if you'd like. Uh, Wooly Will goes limping off, and Oris is already, like, thunderously whispering at him. The hell was that all about? The hell am I going to the Capitol? You said I should never go to the Capitol. You know why? Uh, Oris is not a sneaky fellow. Um, even in his, you know, road dark clothes. He's not dirty clothes, but they're all browns and grays and blacks. Uh, he's got andled pale skin, um, and he's six and a half feet tall, and his idea of a whisper is not. Uh, so you can definitely hear them receding. Um, uh, and as has often been the case, the grandchildren and the ward are free to have their own meeting in the hallway outside the solar. So you've got a few minutes here if you want to before you head down to the feast and we will fast forward. First things first, Adam. Mm -hmm. Are you up to another long trip? Well, I mean, it's not like we have a choice. I know, but... It influences how many wagons we need to take. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm coming with you. You're absolutely coming with. Uh, I'm 
so <laughs> you're up for it is what you're telling me and that you are on board just as much as we are <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm with you excellent just got home I just I know that can be jarring <laughs> Well, no, no, it is. It's fine. All right then. What, what do you uh, think that was about? The between between grandfather and Will. I have absolutely no idea. And uh, I hear most things, but I have no idea what goes on between him and Will. Sir Will. Uh, as a reminder and a, a further complication of their. Uh, strange relationship. Don't forget that Sir Will was knighted by Lord Robert Baratheon during Robert's rebellion. Uh, he was a man at arms that fought under Robert at the Battle of Stony Sept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, not awkward at all. Why, his nickname is uh, you know of the Bells because that was called the Battle of the Bells, and because hedge knights take nicknames from stuff. Um, but again, for some reason, he's always been welcome here. And it's a story that you've all been told a half hundred times. Um, uh, but yeah, so it's it's hard to read those two. Uh, it's weird. Why is this fucking hairy brute of a river lander that followed Robert? Why is he even in here? Um, but yeah, it's it has been the cause of quite a few childhood ruminations uh, from the lot of you throughout your young lives. Like, I was like who is this guy? You know. But continue back to the scene. So I'm just as in the dark as you are. You haven't missed anything about that while you were gone. (laughs) Uh, Sir Vannon? Yes? I would say go drink deep because we hit the road early. (laughs) All the more reason not to, I'm afraid. But this is your evening, and I want you to enjoy it. Uh, I will have our belongings prepared. I can't imagine more joy than I've already experienced. But further, the opportunity that this presents. (sighs) A tournament so soon? I couldn't have entered, except now. (laughs) That's going to be glorious, isn't it? Are you ready for battle? Throws a look at uh, Bela, which is... I'm trying to hide that I might have a crush on her. Of course. Of course. Reyna, are are you prepared for the implications of what that Raven's note said? I am prepared to face the possible implications. But there are many. And we will have to provide a united front in such a place. We will be surrounded by people who do not, do not respect or love us. I mean, Bela, is that the applications that you mean? Or do you mean something well. else? You don't think we're going to be in danger, are we? I mean, I mean, I mean, other than the normal amount of danger. <laughs> the normal amount. <laughs> well, well, the roads are hardly safe on the road to King's Landing, and no. from the rumors that I've heard, King's Landing might be more dangerous than the roads. Well, I mean, Luke's been okay, hasn't he? Luke has flourished there. Um, yeah, yeah, that he. Is a good... He might have the knowledge we'll need in order to navigate the area. And make sure that we're representing our house properly. Yeah. It'll be nice to see him. I've missed him. If anything, it'll be refreshing to find bandits on the road who aren't vulture kings. (laughs) All right, then. Uh, Go down uh, and spend time with the family. (laughs) Uh, And I will make sure that the servants know to get all of our chests ready. (laughs) 
Uh, right, the the packing, those details and stuff, uh, we're going to be glossing over until a summary tomorrow morning as you are hitting the road. Um, does anyone have any particular plans, uh, any conversations that are burning a hole in their soul? Uh, or we just want to fast forward through a montage of celebration and goodbyes uh, and cut to the next day. I think we can probably do that as far as I'm concerned. I don't, I mean, I'm sure we could fill the rest of this session with just talking to people and such, but I think we can move the plot along. Sure. I would be all right with that because while I might want to seek advice, I'm sure as seven hell's not going to. (laughs) Um, If any NPCs approach for a conversation, I'm happy to keep it short, but to the point, but otherwise carry on. Uh, there will be conversations. Um, we can we can fill in that uh, with flashback conversations if anybody wants to later. Uh, one downside we have this week um, is that we, for literally the only time in this campaign that I have planned, kind of have a goalpost because uh, we're going to try and get to King's Landing so that Robert, uh, young Sir Lucaris, uh, can join in and misses out as little as possible. Uh, so for literally the only time we have planned, we're trying to actually get somewhere kind of on a time budget. Um, yeah, that's tough. So um, there are conversations aplenty. Uh, there's kind of parental advice coming from all these retainers uh, that you have been discussing, uh, you know, your training with and, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, and then we've got kind of a slow montage uh, as a soulful tune is playing the next morning, the montage is going to continue uh, as Oris is loading your travel chests up onto their wagon. Uh, they have a, a big wagon uh, that they use for their travels. Um, and, and Oris is loading all your travel chests up on there. Uh, he's loading a, he's unloading all their shit and loading yours up. And even in this, like, slow-motion, soulful music interlude thing, you can see that he's, like, cursing at Wooly Will as he's doing it. Like, they're arguing the whole time uh, as he's unloading all their stuff and then reloading some of it and all this much finer stuff uh, of House uh, Nymerian. Uh, There are a pair of pavilion tents in your house colors that are quite fine, and each of you has, like, leather wrapped chests with like metallic inlays around the corners and you know fancy stuff like that and he's loading each of your travel chests up um and and all that uh grandfather uh embraces each of you which is kind of rare targaryens aren't big huggers uh but yeah he's like you know this stately aloof grandfather uh embraces his grandchildren in a short little like jump cut from each of you. Vannon gets a warrior's handshake, wrist to wrist, which is in its way a warmer embrace. Um, But everybody gets their goodbyes. uh, And then the camera is gonna kind of pull back and zoom out uh, to most of you riding, Oris driving the wagon and Adam riding on the bench next to him. Uh, There is a mule and a few spare horses Uh, in a train behind the wagon. Uh, And we are gonna cut to a commercial uh, as we go take our intermission break and we segue to peril on the road to King's Landing. So Erica, drop a fat beat and give us a break (laughs) screen and uh, everybody enjoy some music tossed together by the one and only Clifton Wright, uh, Mr. Johnson from from, uh, Arcology fame. Uh, and we'll be back after a, a brief break. So we'll see you guys in a couple of minutes.
and welcome back everybody uh when we last left off the young scions of the ancient house nymerian uh had just hit the road uh with a brooding bastard uh well, a brooding lowborn named oris uh driving a wagon uh with the uh twisted leg uh lordling adam nymerian sitting on the bench with him as they have this kind of faintly outsized uh wagon uh, with all the necessary goods for the house in it, uh, and then a trio of outriders, uh, the young ladies of House Nymerian, Reyna and Bela, uh, and Sir Vanen Rivers, uh, newly knighted uh, and on his own prancing uh, war-trained steed. Uh, there's also a small train behind the wagon. Uh, they've got a pack mule uh, and a, a rouncy, uh, a kind of a reddish brown with a dark mane uh just kind of muddy colors like most of everything else that are owned uh by woolly will of the bells uh woolly will's personal heraldry actually as a knight uh is just a black bell on a brown field uh it looks like it was kind of hurriedly thrown together as he was knighted uh and it's easy for all the rest of their color scheme to match so their stuff is very clearly kind of just drab and like natural wood colors work and still look right. And so uh, it's a sharp contrast to the kind of steely gray and the gold and the wine wine red of House uh, Nymerian. Um, so uh, the wagon is pulled by uh, a faintly oversized draft horse uh, that just kind of trudges steadily along. Um, and we're going to fast forward through a lot of the travel, uh, again, with kind of generic movie-style jump cuts uh, that show the lot of you trudging along. Uh, it, it shows you all caring meticulously for the horses. Uh, Oris will do more than his fair share there as squire, and he clearly knows his way around the animals. Uh, you have spent your life serving masters of horses and masters of hounds and stuff, Van in, in particular. Uh, and especially for a guy his size, he is almost startlingly gentle uh, and careful with, with the horses. Uh, firm hand on the reins when they need to be, um, but uh, he clearly knows what he's doing. Uh, and you're all a little concerned whenever somebody else is caring for your horses, but it's, it's he, he knows it. Um, and, and all the stuff's getting uh, cared for um, there is one small thing, uh, that Oris does differently, um, that, uh, you remember from a flashback joke of the morning that you left. Uh, and that's normally to care for a knight's mail. Uh, you put it in a barrel with some sand, uh, good dry sand, and then you roll the barrel around and it's like a, like a tumble, uh, in a, in a washer and the sand just scours any rust and stuff off of the mail, and then you can take it out and you oil it and care for it. Uh, Oris instead um, seems to have awakened half of the knights and squires in the keep uh, the morning that you were leaving. Um, and and you can see the strong cider hungover, and Sir Adam <laughs> hungover, uh, and, and uh, the Septon hungover, uh, and all the other former fighting men are watching um, and, and kind of laughing with Wild Wooly. Uh, but Oris is doing like a kettlebell routine with a barrel full of Wild Wooly sized chainmail and sand. Like he's lifting it up and like slinging it up over his head, holding it for a second and then slinging it down. Like instead of just poking it with a stick and chasing it around the yard, uh, he's like, like lifting and tossing it. Um, he's topless for this. This is somebody might enjoy the show, but it's clearly where at least some of that bulk comes from. And and, Wool, and Wooly just tells him, I never told him about the rolling. <laughs> Look at the boy, big as a draft horse. Do I know what I'm doing or not? Uh, and Oris is just over there, just fucking slinging around this heavy, heavy uh, Will of the Bells sized suit of armor and a barrel full of sand. Uh, like it's just his normal fucking daily thing. Uh, so he will keep that up as caring for your mail. Um, but the good news is you guys are in Dorne for the start of this trip. 
Uh, but you are looking at about a two-week journey. And we're going to say that you're about ten days in. Uh, this little caravan uh, wound its way through the Red Hills of Dorne, partially on the road uh, that everyone moved. Uh, Sorry, guys. Rusty's PC just crashed. Oh, no. Shit. All right. Well, yeah. I guess we can uh, have conversations on. on the road. Or here he is. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your push to talk? I got it pushed. So, hi. Uh, my PC has gone to a blue screen of death, so I'm going to steal Felicia's voice for a bit. Uh, you have wound your way out of the Red Hills of Dorne, uh, partially with the road uh, that your house keeps and maintains uh, in the name of the Princes of Dorne. Uh, and you've partially been able to cut a day or two off your journey because there are uh, passes and paths that can only just barely hold this wagon that only the keepers of the Stoneway know. Uh, so you're able to shorten the journey a bit, uh, but you're, you're making pretty good time uh, and you are clearly out of Dornish territory uh, as the weather starts to turn uh, and the the general background shifts from red and gold of, of stone and sand uh, to the lusher blues uh, and greens of the clear skies, the rainy skies sometimes, uh, and, and the lush green undergrowth of, of the stormlands, uh, which is to say the Dornish marches, uh, which is an area that has been often fought over uh, by, you know, people like your house and people like these houses. Um, so let's go ahead and pick it up with uh, some chatter. Um, as Oris grumbles a little, like, of course it's going to rain. We're going north, and I've got to care for uh, one, two, three, every suit of armor in Westeros. So sure, drizzle, drizzle away. Why not? Grumble, grumble, grumble. The um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Ash. Well, I'm get, I'm trying to at fix least, the cameras. I I'm aware. At least it isn't snow. What is well, that like anyway? Oops. What do you mean? I've never. I've forgotten what snow looks like. Really, um. Well, it's cold and wet and fluffy. All right, then. <laughs> God. That sounds it's... dreadful. <laughs> sounds refreshing. Well, you, you get used to it after a while, but it's more pleasant when you're on the inside looking out. Damn. <sighs> this is uh, it's taken quite a while. Yeah. I think uh maybe we only have a few days left. I don't know. Maybe we can go hunting for something at some point. It's kind of boring, to be honest. I would do like you, that very much. Do you suppose <clears throat> Do you suppose that the ladies will be allowed to enter if not the lists, perhaps the melee? Or archery? Oris will shrug his shoulders. He goes, well, Dornish women can be knights. Knights can tilt. Big smile. Good. <laughs> Shouldn't it Look be over. to our advantage, though? Certainly there'll be those that will underestimate us because we are women. Much more to their dismay. Well, actually, there's a there's a way around that. If you're if you're interested, um, you can register as a mystery knight. Don't tell anyone your name. Wear a disguise. Make up. I'm not going to disguise myself. I want to <laughs> okay. see the look in their eyes as as I tower above them with my spear to their throat. Okay. Hmm. Or it's kind of or it's kind of snorts a little at. The thought of you towering over someone, presumably. <laughs> uh, not so much the spear part, because it's Valyrian steel and that's hard to miss. <laughs> but the towering part is probably 
a little amusing to me. <laughs> Are you looking uh, forward to this, Oris? Doesn't matter. What do you mean? I mean, it doesn't matter what I look forward to. That, you're a squire, but that doesn't deny you an opinion. Oh, I'm just saying the opinion doesn't matter. My wants are second to the ones. Oh, no. I'm sorry, Oris, you were de well, my life to King's Landing at a whim to squire for a half dozen fucking strangers. So it doesn't matter what I look forward to or not. And he gives a half-hearted little slap on the reins that Boulder, uh, the, the draft horse, does not acknowledge. Is he all right? I do. Is that what Adam is saying? I just thought you'd look forward to a chance to distinguish yourself. Not likely to get the chance. Sir Will has never let me enroll in the lists, and I was told to be careful in the capital because the capital's dangerous. It's supposed to be more dangerous to me now than I ever even knew it was because a knight can apparently lie to his squire for that squire's whole life. I'm sorry. What exactly happened, Doris? <laughs> It, can, it feels like there's something you want to talk about. Uh, he will glower uh, and, and sulk and kind of hunch over, not just against the rain. He goes, <clears throat> turns out that I'm not, I'm not nobody like I thought. I was just Oris. You, you lot knew me, I was just Oris. Willie Will's squire. And, and uh, lowborn and uh, nobody and being a squire was a step up from being nobody and, and ever earning a knighthood is an even bigger step up but I'm not nobody I'm not Oris I'm, I'm Oris Waters Congratulations Huh. It found out my mom was a high-born lady. The lady I thought was my mom was just a nursemaid that took me in because my mother didn't want me. That seems like a step up as well. I was making steps up. I was low-born and making something of myself. And instead, now it turns out that I'm a bastard who's just a bastard squire to a head knight. It was a step back. It's a step down. I should be doing more by 18. Sir Will's never even let me enter into the lists. Sir Will never even told me about my own mother. And if a knight so... can lie to someone that long about so much, what's the point in even being a knight? Knowing him as I do, and as you do, don't you think it's possible that he said it simply for the sake of protecting you? Perhaps he knew you'd take it this way? He said it was protecting me, but... Do I look like I need his protection? He's... You look like a newly minted 18-year-old man, but you weren't always, were you? Once you were a boy with noble blood and a loose end for someone to tie up. If you think being a bastard is so bad, then I suppose you and I shall have words, won't we? He snorts derisively at that uh, <laughs> and lets it hang in the air for a second, so you're not sure what part he's snorting at. And he goes, squires aren't supposed to brawl with their knights, and I'm supposed to be your squire. You're quite right. And if you're my squire and I'm your knight, then I'm to give you every opportunity, aren't I? Give him a meaningful look. He will glower and shrug in that diffident, rebellious teenage way. Only bigger. I've been hogging the spotlight, so I shrug and trot on. Uh, I know 
we had talked in the past about Adam and Van and having thoughts about similar topics, you know, sons being sent away and stuff. So feel free. Felicia and I are going to juggle in and out as we try to get my PC going again. But let's keep things rolling. Okay, trot over by Adam. Are you riding a horse or are you in the wagon? In the wagon. Okay, trot up near the window. Horses make me nervous. All comfortable in there? Yes, it, yes, it's comfortable. Yeah, it's a, sorry, out of here, it's an open topped wagon. Yeah. So yeah, That's there's no, no window cover stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, Not I, a yeah. carriage. Yeah. Are, are, are you two all right? That seemed a bit tense. Well, the Horus is an ornery sort. It's fine. I, 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 I didn't really feel like I could say anything because I, um, I don't. I haven't seen him in ten years. You have the benefit of the last name of great import. I think you can say what you like. Well, s still, um, you know, I don't know what his life is like, so I'm. Uh, I could. I would probably just make him more angry if I tried to give him. I mean, who am I to? Uh, well, I'm. So I, I don't have any advice. To, I don't have any advice to give. I think your advice comes from a, a place he might be able to relate to more. Vanin. Really? Vanin, I mean. All right. I had hoped so. We'll find out. Just, I mean, please, please don't fight. <laughs> oh, we're not going to well, fight until we get to the to the training grounds. No, I'm, then I'm, we're I'm, going. I'm, then I'm, we're I'm, going to fight a lot. Yeah, we're going to be yeah, fighting that's, quite that's, a bit there. Yeah, there's a difference between sparring and fighting, but yeah. I that think there will be we're, plenty we're, of opportunities we're, we're, for any of us to represent our house. And even those Raven, who squire for us shall be given yeah. opportunities as well. Yes, I mean, just, you know, Raina said we need to give a united front. We shouldn't fight with each other. Given what Oris has discovered, it's perfectly understandable that he feels resentful and perhaps more than a little confused about who and what he is. We can I give him the opportunity that. to find out. But what about you, Adam? I'm sorry, my lord. I haven't seen you since you were a boy. Well, um... It's, it's a bit strange coming back I feel like I know everything very well, but also don't know it at all. The benefit of an outsider's view, my lord. Mm. Perhaps. Things are very different in the north. How so? Well, I suppose the, the, the people are rather like the land, sort of cold and impenetrable <laughs> but uh, and well for that reason I, I never fully fitted in there you're not worried you won't fit in here now are you a little bit I suppose you know I'm <laughs> I'm not coming back at night like I was supposed to What happened? What? Why didn't that occur like you thought it was going to? Well, my leg's never going to get any better than it is now. I can stand and walk on my own for the most part. And that's something to be thankful for, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to ride the way I used to um, I'll I'll never charge with a cavalry I'll I'm not ever going to be good enough to be a knight and 
Oh, I that's to, foolish. I need to. I need to decide now what I can be. Ah, uh, there's plenty of things you could be. If you still want to Aaron. go down the route of being a martial person, just look at Aunt Elia. No one's gonna conf- con- uh, No one's gonna accuse her of not being an awesome warrior. Just because she stands or rides and, and uses a bow, <laughs> she, she's killed so many bandits and. Don't think More that the only that. thing to combat is riding a horse with a spear or going into a melee with a sword. There's so much more. You could easily command a company of archers and let us all learn tactics, <clears throat> guide the swords of others. Or, my lord, you might consider leaving marks upon history which have nothing to do with war. If we should invite peace, then... There will be those who need to build the great edifices which last through time. Or write the histories themselves. I might. I'm taking this trip as an opportunity to look for where I fit in best. See what the Adam. gods did in my way. You're not married. And you... <clears throat> Have only to choose your path, and you will master it. Thank you, Raina. It is what we do. (laughs) Your encouragement heartens me. Thank you. I have every confidence that you... You will rise above in whatever way you choose. Just need to do the house proud. Make myself Hello, useful. You've you're already born with, yeah. doing the house proud. <laughs> you're born with a great name and a great mind, my lord. Strong arms can only carry you so far. Or even two legs. And we need you. We need all of us. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I'm not going anywhere. Um. I'm, uh, if there's not many things I'm very sure of right now, but I am sure that I'm back with you to stay. <clears throat> Excellent. Speaking of needing all of you. I need everyone to make an awareness notice roll. Ah! Oh, yay! (laughs) To make a check with a specialty in this game, you assemble yourself your die pool of d6s, uh, equal to, in this case, your awareness. Uh, And then if you have the notice specialty, you add your bonus dice from notice. You roll that assembled pool of dice, and then you get to keep a number of dice equal to your awareness ability. So that's why they're called bonus dice from specialties or from modifiers. You get to roll extra and then drop the lowest ones. So bonus dice just kind of help out your average. Uh, So get me awareness notice rolls. Uh, After the number of dice you get to keep, read me off that total uh, and we will see what we see. Call off whose number you want. Uh, let's default to status order. So we will start uh, with our lady heir, young Ray. 16. Okay, her twin. 15. Okay, young Adam. 8. And Sir Vannon. 16. All right. Uh, luckily, this was a, a pretty easy one. Um, and uh, that's plenty of success. Uh, you see uh, circling crows uh, up ahead, um, and you hear uh, a little bit of uh, snarling and snapping and barking uh, as you get closer. Uh, I assume everyone readies weapons and takes a bit tighter uh, grip on the reins, uh, but uh, as you draw near, uh, easily scattered by a few flung rocks and curses uh, are some wolves uh, that are feasting 
just like you guys feasted about a week and a half ago. <laughs> Except you weren't eating the most delicate bits of a bunch of slaughtered human beings. Oops. You have come across uh, a crow's feast uh, and a wolf's feast uh, of what looks to be the remains of a butchered camp. Uh, again, we're, we're going <laughs> to hand wave through briefly establishing a bit of a perimeter. Uh, there are no threats available. The wolves kind of sulk away. They remind you of Oris a bit. They're like, God damn it, this so is going to dummies. Uh, but they, <laughs> they scatter. It's a large group of people with big ass horses and stuff. Uh, and the wolves have already eaten a fair amount. Um, so they're going to kind of skulk away as long as one or two of you is keeping an eye out and you all know that Adam has his bow ready, uh, you're able to take a look at these corpses uh, with every bit the detail you don't want to. Um, first off, there are no survivors. You're able to very quickly uh, ascertain that. Uh, and any individual body uh, has been just absolutely mauled. And this is all freebies. No need for medicine rolls, for instance, or even uh, awareness checks. Um, it's just that you spotted it all instead of rolling up on it suddenly, so there was no chance for your horses to be spooked. That's those awareness rolls. Uh, this is all very clear uh, and very awful. Uh, crows and wolves uh, all start with the fleshiest, most delicate bits, so you can tell uh, where skin was exposed, uh, and you can tell where some of the most grievous injuries laid these guys out, because that's the easiest access. If a man gets his belly opened by an axe, you, you've all seen the vultures do their share. Uh, so, uh, kind of pattern recognition in this small group, and with how often you all fight against bandits and the like, uh, there's no women in this group. There's no children. Uh, they all look like they were once fairly large, robust, able-bodied men, uh, and most of them are wearing the, the destroyed scraps of light armor. Um, they all have uh, sword belts on them, even if the swords have been taken. Uh, it looks like it was a band of men-at-arms or bandits. You're not seeing sigils and the mm -hmm. like, so a little more likely to be some cell swords or bandits. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. several of you have quite reputable warfare or fighting skills, or both. Um, and you're able to just notice from, uh, again, the time that you've spent fighting bandits, and from where these injuries are, uh, it looks like these men were butchered. Uh, throats are slit and heads are staved in. None of them have uh, like defensive wounds on their forearms or, or that sort of thing. Uh, it, it looks like they were killed in their sleep uh, or otherwise kind of prisoners that were executed type of vibe. You've seen, you know, executions before and murders compared to combats. Um, there are a few knives and daggers uh, lying around. Uh, some of them are bloody. Uh, the only real weapon of note uh, that you can make out among the savaged sword belts and the stuff. There is one broken sword. Looks like maybe one guy was able to try and defend himself. And the queer thing about it uh, is the hilt work. It looks like it was old steel and not as well taken care of as it should have been. Uh, but let's have everyone give me uh, a knowledge roll. Go ahead and roll education if you've got it or tourneys, if you have that specialty. Whichever specialty you have better. This is gonna be kind of a heraldry check. So we're gonna go with knowledge, but you can use the tourney specialty or education. And then we'll get to your question after this, Kevin. Uh, so, uh, what do we got, Reyna? Eight. Bela? Four. Oh, Adam. Fifteen. There we go. What do you got, Vannon? Sixteen. All right. Uh, the fifteen and the sixteen are certainly good enough. 
Uh, <laughs> even the the two twins are like, yeah, it just looks like some Baratheon sword. Uh, it's got uh, the hilt work uh, is like a stag emblem with the antlers as like the cross guard uh, and that sort of thing. And that's not unusual at all. But uh, the bookish young Adam uh, and the surprisingly bookish Sir Vannon, you recognize that this stag is not crowned. So it's a sword that's been around since at least Robert's Rebellion, right? Before he took the crown and they started slapping crowns on everything and they actually changed the sigil of House Baratheon. So looks like an old blade. That might just explain why it's broken. Uh, and Kevin, what was your question or comment? Can I uh, use my survival tracking to try to find some tracks or anything like that? I'm going to save you the roll because it's been steadily drizzling all day and because about eight wolves have been tromping around and dragging at the bodies uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, you're really not able to find much. And it's also just off the road. Uh, there's not uncommon to be little campsites just off a road like this. Uh, and sure enough, there's like the, the ruins of a campfire half underneath one of the bodies. Um, so just way too much foot traffic. Uh, you're not able to find footsteps going out into the woods or whatever. Whoever did this could have just come right from the road. So... Uh, yeah, no no luck there. Um, hard evidence is difficult to find under steady rain and the the feasting of wolves. And then there's essentially a highway right there. Um, but that does tell you that it probably happened last night uh, at the, the latest because nobody else has come along and moved the bodies or anything. So that should be fairly recent. How many? Uh, you count eight men. Well, we should keep this hilt, if nothing else. Yes, see the lack of a crown on the antlers, that's before the rebellion. Oh, this is old. Yeah, it's, it, it is old. Well, what are we going to do with it, though? I mean, you're just going to present it to the king, say we found this? Well, perhaps not the king, but mm. one of his men, certainly. Yeah. Uh, is, there a, are, is there a someone, maker's... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, someone I expect this close to the, the city will know who these men were. Yeah, you're you're still a few days right out. Uh, you're not sure exactly uh, if you're still in the Stormlands or have made it into the Crownlands. Uh, you've still got uh, about two days good ride to go. Um, and especially after Baratheon took the crown the line between Stormland and Crownland has gotten kind of fuzzy. So you're not sure exactly whose uh, lands you're on, uh, but muddy against the the smoke, or muddy against the, the drizzle of the day, uh, there is some smoke up ahead, and you know you did find an inn just a few days ago. So there should be an inn not far from here. Uh, they get more plentiful the closer you get to the capital. So you should be able to find out whose lands these are, Technically, whoever's lands you're on should be the ones keeping the king's peace on these lands. That's kind of what nobles are for. Um, so you could try to present it to somebody here at this house, uh, or they're probably going to be in King's Landing. So if you wanted to present it as some kind of evidence or whatever, uh, the inn would be the place to find out whose lands you're on, and King's Landing might be the place to find that person. So good news you're going in the right direction to follow either of those leads. So what is the proper thing to do with all these bodies? Well, if you knew them um, and they were your retainers, then certainly you would want a, a proper burial. Uh, I don't know how particularly religious any of you are feeling. Uh, Oris certainly isn't reaching for a shovel himself. Uh, he's got a bunch of things on poles that are stuck in the back of the wagon. You've seen him use the hammer to pound in stakes. He's got a big ass ax he used to chop some wood. You know one of them is, is a spade or a shovel, but he doesn't look real eager to like, yeah, let's dig a grave for these eight guys that, you know. So he's not like volunteering. Uh, it's really up to you guys. 
two quick questions. Uh, one was this blade. This blade was Castle Forge steel. Yeah. Uh, no, it did not look like it was of that level of quality. So uh, it's not no poorly mark. made. Yeah, it's it's a standard issue weapon, um, not the kind of master crafted level uh, that gives the bonus to hit and is more likely to have a, a maker's mark. It looks like uh, the sort of mass produced for an army type of sort because you tend to see that sort of house stuff on weapons that they outfit their right. So it could have belonged to somebody who served or it was found by someone after the fact on, you know, with all the belongings of dead soldiers. I look at uh, Reyna. With your leave, I'll bury these bodies. Yeah, yeah I, 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 don't, I don't think we should just leave them to be picked apart by animals, and certainly the whoever they've left behind will thank us for walking on past. Of course. Uh, yeah, Oris, Oris will heave out a sigh that you can hear from his spot at the wagon <laughs> uh, and he clambers down uh, with a faintly outsized shovel. Everything that he has is just kind of big uh, between him and, and Wooly Will. Um, uh, and he just gets to work. He paces off uh, almost methodically like a pacing distance away from a camp. Uh, like he's, no, you gotta do it. have done this before. Um, and he heaves to uh, and just starts digging. I help out. Um, you can offer to spot him. There is just the one big shovel. Um, but yeah, he'll look, he'll give a grunt of surprise uh, if you offer to spot him at the shovel. Um, but he won't, like, argue. Uh, so it takes some time. Uh, it's eight guys that are, you know, reasonably large slash fit. Look like fighting men of some stripe. Uh, it takes a while What's to left do. of eight guys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's about seven guys worth, uh, depending <laughs> on how you want to count the parts. There's uh, the math. But uh, the day is starting to turn uh, tonight by the time it's done. Um, but the good news is that there is that in what looked like not too far away. Or we have this campsite here. It's not occupied yeah. anymore. I say jokingly. No. But there are wolves near about, my lady. Yes, let's not. We'll definitely be going on, and um, she knows I <laughs> like, to, like just like in case the in case the site kind of degenerates to the point where it's unrecognizable. We'd like to mark where the graves are, so that absolutely, so that they can be found later. Yeah, and you've got time to work up a big stake or whatever to drive into the ground while the digging is going on. So yeah, some sort of, you know, plank of wood uh, can get driven into the soft ground. Uh, Oris has a, a big fucking sledge uh, back in the wagon that he's able to hammer something in so it'll, it'll stand just fine. Thank you, uh, Oris. He gives a non-committal grunt. Uh, I'll say prompt. some... Thank you. I'll say some words over the grave... The old gods and the new, mostly the old gods. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to fast forward about 30 minutes of riding through an increasingly chilly drizzle, uh, especially to those of you that are used to Dornish weather. Um, normally, when you do get some rain, um, it's warmer. Uh, and at least normally when it's cooler, you don't get rain because of where you are in the mountains, you tend to not get both wet and cold at once. So this kind of sucks. Uh, but uh, it's not long uh, before you make your way uh, to a fairly large inn. Um, and here you're, you know, day and a half, two days ride out of the capital. So the inns are a little bit bigger and more impressive than they are properly down in the Dornish marches where armies marching through hasn't been quite uncommon. Uh, and, and stuff like that. So it's a big, uh, impressive, kind of comforting building. Uh, and you head inside. Uh, Oris heads off to take care of the horses uh, with a visibly gawking stable boy, uh, whether at the size of the draft horse 
the impressive breeding of the multiple sand steeds uh, that he gets to care for, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so they head off, and you all are able to head in. Uh, Dags Inn is perhaps nothing to write home about, but it's clean, the food smells good, and it is warm and dry. Ooh, I like that. Uh, looking around, um, you see uh, two fairly young ladies uh, serving the drinks and food. Uh, you see a kind of chubby, ruddy, far past his prime uh, innkeep. He's still got pretty broad shoulders, uh, though, and there's a sword uh, kind of mounted uh, on like a placard type of thing behind the bar um, that's that's behind the bar. Uh, you see him up there serving drinks uh, and talking to a similarly chubby post-middle-aged woman. Uh, <coughs> it looks like she is winning the good-natured argument. She is out, uh, out streaking at him uh, as he raises his voice. She's just better at it. His might be a retired sellsword's bellow, uh, but hers is much more practiced, and she is clearly queen here at this age. Uh You see uh, a, a big um, kind of barrel-shaped fellow uh, sitting uh, over pretty near the tap. Um, and uh, it looks like he's drinking his fair share uh, the servant girl that you see is, is clearly on her way, cleaning up a few empty tankards from his. Uh, he looks like kind of a, a, a loud, sort, boisterous. Uh, uh, and there we go. Uh, who is doing what? I'll walk directly to the innkeep-looking gentleman. Uh, he turns at like the sound of footsteps... Uh, and, and looks cheerful and ready, like that quicksilver mood of this kind of good-natured arguing with his wife that dissolves immediately when it's time to be friendly to a customer. Um, and then that look kind of falters a bit uh, as he looks at you and your colors and, and sigil a bit. Uh, but he's still kind of formal. He goes, uh... uh Hello, milady. I said greetings. Uh, I need to uh, obtain boarding for the night for myself and my companions. It will be five of us total. He uh, he gives a quick glance to his wife. Um, who gives a little nod and you're good enough at social stuff that you're able to spot that uh, he goes most of the other highborn folk have already made it through uh, so we've got rooms open uh, it'll be it'll be ten silver uh, that's more than you would expect uh, a silver or two a room is pretty okay but Charging to a room for a place like this is a, a little, little exorbitant. Throw in the food and you've got a deal. And stabling for the horses. That too. Push to talk. So that's everything, right? Uh, he bristles a bit like, I know how to run an inn. Ah, uh, you get your stabling and your meal. Well, that's acceptable then, sir. Uh, I will settle up now so that there's no confusion. Uh, his wife holds a hand out for the coins. I pay her ten silver. All right. Uh, also, out of character, we're going to have a flashback to coins the start of next session so Lucaris can be there for the flashback. Um, you can cover ten silver just fine. Uh, so, uh, the inn is yours. Uh, anybody got particular plans to speak to anybody about anything? Uh, 
Um, I figure it would be a little bit uh, hush on exactly who we are. Like, I'm not going to... Like, other than, like, what I'm wearing and the, the sigils that are on me, I don't think openly talking about you know, house business oh, or things like that is, is smart. So um, definitely won't be doing that. But I'll, I'll make sure to get uh, a couple flagons of ale and... Uh, yeah, you can lay down a couple copper and it will handle drinks for the evening, assuming none of you are drinking to boisterous excess. You raise a few copper and that'll handle your drinks along with your food. Uh, you are getting that same sort of, um, kind of cool, kind of fearful look from the serving girls, uh, from the, the innkeep and his wife. Uh, everybody but the big dude sitting and drinking a lot uh, who sees you and he looks kind of bemused by the lot of you, which might just be how the big dude at the tavern looks at everybody. Uh, he could just be the big dude of this tavern who gives everyone that look. Um, but it does seem a little weird that everyone else is is a little trepidatious around you. Um, and that kind of strange look continues as... Uh, the common room fills uh, as you get a little bit further after dusk um, everyone's coming in from the fields and lots of people are coming in to eat uh, and there's some other travelers on the roads and stuff uh, and you notice most of them are still giving you those kind of ugly looks nobody is like saying anything um, but there's a few kind of double takes uh, and like people turn from like a friendly look to a little bit worried look. I'll uh, make my way to the innkeep if that's all right. Yep. Beg your pardon, friend. Seems a rather cool reception we're receiving here. Is all well? He opens his mouth to start talking, and then his wife answers instead. Everything's fine, sir knight. Just, just fine. Perhaps you could tell me a little bit about the other nobles who've passed through on their way to King's Landing. Uh, you hear a uh, an intake of breath as he gets ready to start talking again, and then his wife cuts in and answers again. Uh, we're not we're not folk for gossip, good sir. Uh, we we offer clean rooms and fine food, and that's all. <laughs> And then, immediately making a liar of her, I'm going to need everybody uh, to roll me 2d6 uh, as each of you listens to rumors in the common room uh, as the chatter picks up uh, around you. Um, give me the 2d6 rolls. Give them to me one at a time. Um, so almost like a percentile roll. Give me, you know, three, four instead of saying seven. Is that making sense? Uh, and we will start uh, with Kevin who the kind of the camera was on and we'll just see what you hear from somebody talking, you know, at the next table. Six, five. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> okay. So immediately as she, uh, we're not ones for gossip, especially about the highborn. Um, <laughs> you hear, uh, uh, and a quick glance shows you that it's, it's a tinker uh, who they travel a lot and they repair stuff. Uh, and you bet your life he's talking to like a blacksmith. Guy's got the broad shoulders. He's still got a little soot on him and like that heavy leather ape. Oh no. Heavy leather apron. Just a piece of oh my gosh. I'm gonna have to fix that. I know. <laughs> Fund our channel so we can fix this PC. <laughs> uh, so, it's clearly a tinker and a blacksmith. Blacksmith's got the broad shoulders, the heavy leather apron, etc. Um, and, and, like, the heartbeat after she finishes saying, you know, oh, we don't gossip around that sort of thing. Give me one second. I've got to find it in the book as opposed to the PDF that I had open when I... This is why the future belongs to the analog loyalists. (laughs) 
uh, with your role, you get uh, a force of soldiers from that House Nymerian. They invaded House Dannet just last week, and the Dannet men ran them off, led by young Adam himself. Those despicable louts scattered like curves, but but not before those no good Nymerians burned and looted a little village and killed something like 15 small folk they did. Lord Adam, he's on his way through now, going straight to the capital with, with evidence I heard, evidence indeed, and, and the sword hand of one of the butchers said too. Uh, and then, uh, just as he's like getting ready to keep going, he kind of catches an elbow from the blacksmith who finally notices the uh, sigils and crests and stuff. I raise a flag into him. <laughs> don't know what you've don't know what you've heard, friend, but two hands, and we certainly weren't anywhere outside of our own lands. <laughs> we, and he, he looks at your card. Uh, oh, well, just I saw the shield myself, sir knight. No disrespect intended, I suppose, but but I saw it. Uh, I'm Arian shield, spattered with the blood of. Innocent small folk, they said. I stand up, walk over to his table. Do you mind if I join you? He looks to the blacksmith, who's a pretty big guy, uh, and they both kind of bristle and go, turns out I kind of do mind, sir, what with, what with what's going on and all. He can't hold your, your gaze. Um, he, he could tell that he kind of regrets saying it as soon as he does, but it looks like he doesn't want to sit with you right now. I shake my head. That's perfectly fine, friend. If I thought as you thought, I'm sure I would feel the same way. But the more I can find out, the more we can clear our good name. For I can assure you, we've hunted not but bandits. In fact, we found eight men dead and feasted upon by wolves just outside of town. Uh, the Tinker is unprepared to argue with a knight. Like, you can tell he kind of wants to, right? But you go, well, I just... Be Please. that as it may. You, speak you save, your speak stories plain, for, friend. save your stories for the capital, then. Uh, you tell it to the king and to, to Lord Adam. Uh, a quick history lesson on House Dannet. Uh, House Dannet are your neighbors to the south. They are bannermen of House Ironwood, that were bannermen of House Nymerian until Robert's Rebellion. The lands that were taken from you after the rebellion and given to House Ironwood uh, included, but were not completely limited to, the lands of, of House Dannet. Um, so uh, the old Lord Dannet uh, recently passed away about a year ago, uh, and his grandson, Adam, um, is the new lord, and he's of an age with you lot, and maybe even a year or two younger. Um, your houses do not like one another, uh, clearly, but um, you have never heard of Adam being the lying sort. Uh, and you guys have had a few little threatening, skirmish kind of display of force things in the years since the rebellion. Neither side has really taken up arms against the other. Uh, a few small folk have, have brawled and, and maybe brought a woodcutter's axe into it, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, but you've both been kind of meticulously avoiding war. Um, but that's House Dannet. Um, they are neighbors of yours that do not get along, and they are bannermen of House Ironwood, which does not get along with you. Um, but you do think it's a little weird. Uh, the, the Ironwoods are an old, an older house than yours, and just as proud in their misplaced way. Um, and lying slaughtering small folk sounds out of character. Like yeah. Um, so there's your rumor. Uh, let's do everyone else's. Um, Erica, what was your role? One three. Uh, I hear that Marita Lucas is engaged to Langley Woods. Uh, it's supposed to be formally announced there at the Capitol. So romantic during the tourney, him expressing his undying love and affection before the whole field and stuff. But, well, but that Langley is nervous, and who would blame him? 
it's after what's happened to Marita's last two husbands. <laughs> I wouldn't want to marry the Black Widow. <laughs> um, you know that House Lugas is a Stormlands house, um, but none of you have really been listening to gossip from the Stormlands, uh, especially given relations between Stormlanders and the Dornish. I'm not even going to really allow for roles to pick up on that. Uh, you do know House Woods is a northern house, so she's having to travel kind of far afield, it would sound, for new suitors. Uh, but yeah, Lugas is a, uh, a Stormlander house. Uh, Ash, what was your role? 5-4. Oh, I heard Lord Stannis himself isn't going to his niece's name day tourney. There's no prying him uh uh, Alf Dragonstone still bad blood between him and King Robert and you know what they say about feuding families no no they'll not get him off Dragonstone ha! especially not for a feast so you hear that it fits with most of what you've all heard about Stannis uh, and Felicia what was your role Everybody knows the tourney's not honestly for Princess uh, uh, Princess Marcella. Marcella's name day. Uh, I hear it's because the queen got pregnant again. It hasn't been formally announced yet. But I have a cousin who's got a sister who's a servant in the palace. And she heard that the queen has morning sickness. Uh, and everyone knows it's normally the king who's throwing up all morning. <laughs> Uh, and then I rolled uh, for Oris and just for general group chatter. Uh, and you hear, trouble befell that house Corbray on the road. Uh, their youngest brother died. Uh, pathway washed out on their way down out of the Vale. It's just the Lord and that Lynn Corbray now. Uh, out of character, you guys aren't big fans of house Corbray. Uh, they are a Vale house. Uh, you know Sir Lynn's name in particular because he was the one that uh, slew Prince Lewin Martell of the Kingsguard and broke the Dornish lines at the Battle of the Trident. Uh, so Lynn Corbray is a famed and dangerous knight uh, that most Dornishmen uh, in particular don't think very highly of. So there is some good news uh, mixed in with all of this. If there's one less Corbray in the world... Uh, and you didn't even have to do it yourself at the melee. <laughs> uh, so there is some gossip for the night. Um, one second. All right, and my computer is still slowly loading, so I apologize for that. Uh, but anyone else have any particular plans for the tavern tonight? I think, well, Adam's kind of used to just trying to blend in and not cause, not draw too much attention um, to himself. So he's kind of conscious of the the tension in the room. Um, so he's probably not approaching any strangers, but kind of trying to appear as kind of normal and personable as as possible, especially given that there are unpleasant rumors about the house flying around. So try to avoid trouble. Sounds like a song, a sound plan. Uh, hey, what about your big sister? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm going to get into any more trouble. It, it's kind of easy to, to read the room here that some people uh, are uh, maybe not too happy to see us here. And I'm sure you'll contribute to some sort of gossip that may or may not happen in this place and elsewhere. Okay. Uh, is Sir Vannon going to go looking for any trouble? Looking for trouble? No. But prepared if it comes. I'll retire to my room but uh, stay up like working on my heraldry for my shield and whatnot because there probably wasn't enough time to, you know, set up a sigil. Sure. I mean, it's just, so it I've, just takes a little painting. Uh, you can yeah, try to rough it out. Time. Yeah, you can try to rough it out yourself, or you are on your way to the capital, which is going to be full of all sorts of people. You know, any tourney 
has people ready to to paint armor and, and shields and stuff. So you That's can true. you can mull it over. Um, All right. In that case, so, I retire to my room, but I've got my ears open in case there's trouble. You know prepping my weapons, got them all close at hand, and tell my hunting hound, Apollon, to chill out nearby. Sure. Um, it sounds like no one's going looking for trouble, uh, so trouble will not necessarily find you. Uh, there is just the kind of disconcerting, like, knowing that everyone around thinks ill of you that is new to most of you. Um, so it's, it's an uncomfortable evening. It's not the fault of the, the food, which is simple tavern fare. Uh, you know, good yeasty rolls, uh, along with a stew of some sort of meat, probably more than one. Uh, you know, just simple stuff you can scoop out and serve to people fairly cheaply. Uh, it's fine, but unremarkable, um, etc., etc. Um, the next morning, you do hear the telltale rattle and thump uh, of Oris tending to everyone's mail uh, with his workout routine of a barrel full of, of chain mail and ring mail and stuff uh, and lots of salt. Um, and he gets an early start on it because everyone got caught in that rain yesterday. Um, but you are able to, to be ready to go. Uh, the innkeep is a little kind of surly uh, and reluctant uh, with the breakfast, but a couple coppers can change his mind pretty easily. Uh, we're going to gloss over that intrigue. Uh, you guys don't have to bully him with dice. Um, he will go, oh, fine, fine, and some extra biscuits. Let none speak ill of Dag's Inn or the hospitality you found here, no matter who you are. Quite the opposite. I'll, um, I'm I'll be able to quite confidently sing your praises, sir. He gives you a look like he thinks you're making fun of him, uh, which is a look that lots of small folk give lots of nobles that try to be nice, or like it might be a trap, which is kind of the look the tinker gave the knight last night. When you were like, no, buddy, go ahead and argue. Like, like that's how most knights would say it. Like, sure, speak your mind, friend. And then they put their hand on their sword. Yeah, so it's just the nature of small folk. They know, you know. Uh, so they look a little suspicious at your your compliment, um, but he doesn't like spitting your food or anything like that. So um, you get uh, uh, a little kind of bundle of bacon and some biscuits uh, to make sandwiches on uh, on the road, uh, and then we were going to do a, another travel montage of sorts. Uh, and then we're gonna call for awareness notice rolls. Uh, as you're making your way through the woods themselves, uh, you're now in the Kingswood, uh, less than a day's good ride uh, out of the capital. So give me that awareness notice again. Uh, just let me know if anybody doesn't beat a 10. No, I'm fine, 13. 19. Okay. As long as any of you made it, it is fine. So, uh, my assumption, again, uh, is that Adam is on the wagon with Oris, and the other three are on their, their personal mounts. Yes, uh, I know Adam yeah. is still kind of avoiding horseback. Um, so, uh, you spot them, uh, and it's not actively raining right now, uh, but the skies are still overcast, uh, and you are in a, an area with a decent amount of winds. So it turns out the wind catches these shots just as they miss you, uh, but thunking into the seat between Oris and Adam uh, and sailing over Bela's head uh, are a pair of arrows that catch your eye just as you round a bend. Uh, and you see... <coughs> oh, no. Uh, a, a pair of armed men uh, on the road ahead and a couple of shapes in the kind of underbrush on the side of the roads as they hurriedly knock arrows and get ready to attack again. So, let us commence with our combat tutorial. Uh, everyone, roll me initiative. Uh, and keep in mind that this roll is going to be modified by whatever armor you are traveling in. 
Uh, you know, remember I, I mentioned you can wear lighter armor, heavier armor, whatever. Uh, but you're going to be making an agility quickness test. So agility is the the ability score. Quickness is the appropriate specialty. Uh, and then whatever your armor penalty is uh, for what armor you have on lowers your total mm -hmm. by that amount after you make that roll. Okay. I have a nine. So Raina will go first. She's rolling. One second. Lovely. Sorry. One second. I also don't have my note document handy. Uh, Raina rolled a four. So she will announce her initiative first, but probably <laughs> not go first. Uh, so let's hear from Bela. I have a nine. Initiative from Bela? Nine. God dang it. Um, hold on. Let me, uh... Did we lose Erica? Can you hear me now? She's having some trouble with the sound. Hold up fingers. <laughs> All right. Bela has a nine. Nine? Oh, no. Here. I'm going to leave the call real quick. Come back. And I'm worried now because we lost. There we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. Here we go, Erica. So you had a nine. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Adam. Seven. Surveyin. Running nine with Bela. Surveyin. So. It's all good. Uh, right. And then it's Frankenstein. All right. Uh, we're just gonna. Have Oris go last because he's an NPC. Uh, and one second for these guys. He has to take the free action sulk before he can do anything else. Well, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> one of the penalties for being a bastard. Ouch. Hey! <laughs> it's harsh, okay. but fair. Combat initiate, Jon Snow. But I'm a bastard. <laughs> um, as an aside, what I'm a fan of in games that have, for lack of a better term, kind of mook level NPCs, uh, I tend to roll their initiative as a group or in groups based on their armament. Uh, so like you guys are up against two bow wielding NPCs and two melee NPCs, uh, and I'm gonna have them go in those two groupings in larger groups with more notable characters, we're going to do individual initiative. But for this, uh, we're going to kind of keep it simple and streamlined. Uh, and also, as for lack of a better term, mook level bad guys, I'm not going to let them take wounds or injuries, which are the methods of damage mitigation, uh, partially just to speed up the fight, partially because often small folk level threats don't get to because that's one of the ways to make knights and player characters and stuff more badass by comparison. That said, two of these NPCs are up first, and it's the two with the bows. Uh, so uh, they're going to hurriedly uh, take another shot. The good news is they don't seem to be super great at this, judging by the first shots. Uh, Bela, what is your combat defense? It is a nine. Okay. Uh, they rolled a, a nine exactly. Uh, so that is not going to do any extra damage. Uh, if they hit by more, if you hit by more, if anybody hits by more, uh, damage is doubled and tripled and that sort of thing. But they barely hit you, so you're going to take three points of damage, which could be mitigated uh, by what sort of armor you're wearing. It is. I'm wearing scale. Okay, so you're out to look impressive uh, and or you're worried about the bandits you ran yes. into yesterday, <laughs> potentially bandits. So yeah, uh, it's going to kind of just glance off your armor. Uh, it was a, a, a narrow hit to begin with. Uh, the other one is going to take a shot at Sir Vannon this time uh, because he is on a fast-looking horse 
and that is the natural bane of archer folk. Uh, Vanin, what is your combat defense? With my armor, it is 16. Yeah. With, with, what? oh, okay. That's going to be awful high for with armor. Um, remember, combat defense is a combination of agility, athletics, and awareness. Um, and then it is modified if you're using a shield that adds to it. But armor is going to lower it. Oh. Yes, that combat defense penalty that armor gives, it lowers it and makes you easier to hit, but armor provides damage resistance. So that's the trade-off. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had it as my unarmored nine. Armor is a breastplate for five, and my shield is a plus two. So. Gotcha. So what's the combat defense on a breastplate? I believe it's a minus two. Yeah. Okay. So it basically cancels out the shield because um, you're using just a regular shield, right? Not a large shield? Yeah, just a regular shield. Right. So, so it'll be 14 then? No. Um, remember, armor does not modify it. it, it rather, it lowers okay. it. Armor resistance okay. is a separate thing from combat defense. So your, okay. your combat defense is a 9, but the plus 5 that the armor gives, that's damage resistance. Okay, in that so, case, uh, so it's a seven unarmored with the minus two? But you have a plus two from the shield. Okay, so, so the, the shield cancels out the armor. Yes, yeah, so it's a nine. Now I understand. Thank you. There we go. Uh, you are also hit, but only with a single degree of success. Uh, so their basic three damage is not enough to get through armor and shield. So you can describe it as catching it on your shield if you want, uh, or it, it spans off the, the heavy armor. So their archers, uh, unfortunately for you, got to go first. But fortunately for you, uh, they're not great shots, and it's a little bit windy. Uh, so that brings us to Bela and her nine. Well, uh, I'm going to uh, pull out my spear and ride up to the archers and try to uh, spear one. A sound plan. Uh, on horseback, you're able to move at a, a pretty good clip. Uh, and also, attacking people on foot while you are on horseback gives some pretty substantial bonuses. Um, if you would like to make this a charge attack, uh, it's going to increase the base damage, but you get to keep one less die that you roll. Or you can just make an attack where you ride up and then as a separate action, you attack. Um, you're gonna assemble the same die pool either way. And this is where fighting on horseback gets to be pretty fun because you've got your basic dice pool of your fighting ability, and then you add a die or two or whatever for your special training with that weapon. Uh, and then you take away bonus dice if the weapon has a training modifier. But I believe you're using the house spear because why wouldn't you? And a basic spear has no modifier. So you've got a fighting of, I believe, four, correct? I do. And then spears of one? Spears of two, actually. Spears of two. So you're going to be rolling to start six dice and keeping four. But you are fighting on horseback against an opponent that is not. So you get additional bonus dice equal to your animal handling. Oh, wow. So that's going to be another three or four. You don't get to add the bonus from ride as like a specialty of animal handling. It's just animal handling. Uh, but for you, as I recall, that's another three or three, four dice, right? Three more. Okay. Six. So uh, if you don't charge, it's going to be six dice keep four. If you do charge, it's, uh, or sorry, it's going to be nine dice keep four. If you do charge, it's nine dice, keep the best three, but the base damage of your attack goes up by two, which can okay. then potentially get multiplied. So it can add up pretty quick. So it's your call. I'm going uh, to not charge, charge or... so that I can keep four of the dice on gotcha. nine. All righty, so nine dice, keep four. Should be looking at a bunch of fives and sixes if the curve holds out. <laughs> Yeah, so that will be uh, 21. No, oh, 22. Oh, just missed them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, that is a sound hit. Uh, was the 22 
from adding on the uh, Valyrian steel? That's correct. Like, was that also factored in? Okay. So a 22, uh, he's got a combat defense of seven. Uh, so a seven would be one degree of success. Uh, a 12 gets you a second. A 17 gets you a third. And a 22 gets you four degrees of success. Ooh. So what is the base damage of your spear? Base damage is five. Right. Uh, so you just stabbed this dude for 20 points. <laughs> and it has pierced that, one. <laughs> yes. Uh, that is more uh, than enough. Uh, these yeah. guys are wearing like a padded gambeson with like a few leather patches in a few spots. It's somewhere between padded and leather armor. Um, but the piercing does not notice that. Uh, it is a fine Valyrian weapon. Uh, and you are able to just run this guy through. That is more than enough to oh. one-shot him. Uh, so yeah, uh, describe it. Uh, <laughs> where did you want to stab him? Because you stab him right the fuck there. <laughs> All right, so so I ride up and uh, I'm brandishing the the spear and I do a flourish, twirl it around, and then catch him right across the uh, the neck, just to just to try to lop off his head and and be done with it. That is what happens, uh, because four degrees of success is technically the most you can get in this game. Um, so yeah, uh, it is a messy, messy thing. Um, not least of which, because it's kind of a unique fighting style. He's expecting kind of a knightly lance straight at him, and instead like you ride past him and then flick out with the blade using that wide, impossibly sharp Valyrian steel, almost like a sword. And, yeah, he does not know what gets him. Uh, to clarify, for my own edification, was that one of the archers or one of them that is now brandishing an axe? It was an archer. The one that okay. shot at me specifically. That is fair and reasonable. Uh, and he is dead. Uh, so, Vannon, you are up at nine. Um. So, acting at the same time, I'm riding up towards the other one. Is it possible for me to try to hit him with the flat of the blade, like knock him out or something instead of kill him? Uh, you can. Uh, off the top of my head, I do not recall what the penalty is. So we will say that it will be minus one kept die. Um, so you still get to roll the full handful of whatever, um, but it'll be minus one that you get to keep. Okay. So you're using a bastard sword, right? Correct. Okay, so it's going to be your fighting, uh, plus your long blade <laughs> bonus dice, minus one bonus die for the bastard sword training requirement. But I have the training requirement. Right, but you still lose that die. Oh. Um, the difference is that you're not taking an additional penalty, so you don't get to roll that one extra die. Um, gotcha. But you still get to keep your full complement. Um, so, uh, fighting five, as I recall... Uh, mm -hmm. The blade would make it six, goes back to five for the training requirement. Uh, and mm -hmm. then what's your animal handling? Three. So you're going to be rolling eight dice, keeping five. If you try to injure instead of kill him, uh, we're going to say it's eight dice, keep four. Eight dice, keep what? Keeping four. So it's, okay. it's minus one kept die for that attempt. Oh, me, oh, my. That's a six. That's a six. That's a five. And I'll take this three. So 12, 17, 20. Okay. Uh, plus one if the that, yeah. Castle Forged Steel works. Yeah. Plus one, yeah. It's an attack roll with a Castle Forged weapon. Uh, okay. So it is literally not quite as impressive. <laughs> as her strike, because you were one point shy of that final degree of success. Um, but it is still an absolutely impressive strike. Uh, what's the damage on the Bastard Sword? Uh, five. Okay. Um, it sounds like a lot. Uh, but it's either four or five. Either way, it's going to be plenty. Um, we will double check some math later. Uh, but, um, yeah, that is still enough. Uh, with his armor rating of one, uh, that is not nearly enough against three times that damage. 
Uh, so you were able to to ride up, and was this an archer or an axeman? Well, I think there was only the axemen left, right? There were only two of them? No, uh, there are two archers and two axemen. Oh, uh, then I went for the other archer then. Okay. Yeah, Doing the a ride by. Yeah, the archers were in the road and started shooting, and then the men with axes were coming out of the underbrush. Sorry okay. if I was unclear. That's all um, good. So, yeah, you are able to ride up, uh, and you clobber him in the head uh, with the flat of the blade or the hilt. Uh, either one will get the job done. Uh, so, uh, at nine, now the two axemen go. Uh, and they are the two that remain. Uh, we're going to have one of them rushing towards the wagon because that was their plan. And one of them is going to turn and rush at the pair of horsemen that are now the closer threats. So, um, one second, even Stevens. All right, uh, he is going to go rushing at Bela. Uh, so she was the, the closer of the two uh, riders. Uh, he is not super great at this, but five, nine, uh, an 11, does that hit you? It does hit me, yes. Uh, does it hit you by less than five, as I recall? That's correct, it's one degree. Yep. So, uh, once again, one degree of success. Your armor is more than enough to soak it, uh, because their damage is a three, as it turns out, uh, with their axes as well. Uh, so, he rides up, uh, and you are able to functionally dodge it. You can catch it as a parry that mostly deflects it. Uh, it just glances off your armor a little. However, you'd like to describe the blow. Uh, it, it's not hitting soundly enough. Uh, the other one, Ash, call me evens or odds. 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 Uh, so he rolled evens. He's going to attack Oris. Uh, you see him looking at you the whole way as he comes running up with this axe. And then you think, like, like you make out the moment when he's like, if I don't kill that guy with this axe, that guy's going to kill me. <laughs> so I know I'm supposed to kill the kid, but he veers off at like the last moment, uh, and he takes a swing at Horus. Uh, the good news is that Horus does not have a low combat defense because Horus is wearing only quilted armor. Um, 11 is enough to hit. Um... And then we're going to do some quick numbers jankery uh, because uh, Oris, uh, three points, gets through Oris's armor because Oris's padded armor gives him one. He's got a quality that makes it two. One point of damage is normally absolutely worth ignoring, but Oris is going to kind of lean into it because fuck this guy. And because Oris has the berserker trait. Oh, and no. any time that Oris mitigates damage by taking an injury or a wound, Oris gets to make a free melee attack. So Oris <laughs> leans into it like this guy's trying to punch him. And he like slings up his left arm uh, to catch the blow so that the blade doesn't hit him, but the haft of the ax does. Um, and it's just like a Captain Kirk catching a guy's punch with his left hand. And then Oris grabs one of the poles somewhere behind him in the wagon. Uh, Bela, pick me a number between one and four. I'm going to choose two. A two. Okay, then. It's the medic. Uh, so Oris, because <laughs> they've got an assortment of pole weapons behind him in the wagon, uh, and he grabs the giant fucking axe slash sledgehammer combo <laughs> with it. Uh, and he takes the axe, or the, the blocking arm that was overhead, and turns it into a grip on this haft also. And he just brings this mattock up and over and down uh, in a single strike. Uh, and honestly, this motherfucker's combat seven, combat defense of seven. Uh, we got five dice. We reroll that one because blood of handles. Um, Oris is hanging with you guys with your 20s and 21s. His is a bit lower. Uh, it's only an 18, but uh, an 18 to hit against combat defense 7 with the base damage of Oris 
plus a giant fucking long axe. Um, this guy's dead. Uh, and he's dead on his own action, which brings extra shame to him in the afterlife. Um, yes. Which uh, leaves one of them for Adam at seven uh, and then for Reyna at four. Uh, but Adam is up first at seven, and there's some some bitch with an axe trying to kill your sister up there. Yeah. Um, so, in in that time, uh, Adam will have grabbed one of his bows. Um, I'm going with the hunting bow stats, uh, and is going to fire at the guy. Uh, sure. We're gonna say that it uses like your your lesser action to just kind of ready the weapon sure. uh, in this case. So you can't get extra cheeky with an aim action. But uh, as I recall from your sheet, you are not likely to need it. So uh, go ahead and sling me that massive handful of archery dice. It's only five. Uh, and remember, remember as you doom this poor fool, you're only looking for a combat defense of seven against him. Yeah, that's 17. So, uh, against combat defense, 7. He needs 7, he needs 12, he needs 17. So that's 3 degrees of success. Uh, so what is your base damage? With it's agility, so... Uh, let me just check that. I think it's 2. Uh, yes, 2. Okay, so that's going to be 6 points of damage. 5 is going to get through his armor. Um, he is still up. Uh, there is an arrow sticking out of his back, and like you fouled his next swing, uh, but you, but you were scared to uh, to aim a little too high because you didn't want to overshoot him and hit your sister or her horse. Firing into Billy is so, dangerous. That one, yeah. Uh, so that one with an axe yet remains, but coming up at initiative four is Lady Reyna, who is on a horse and who has a weapon. And who has her mouth full right now, so she <laughs> can't even holler what she wants to do. Bye -bye. And... She is going to charge up and poke someone with a sword. Flash. So, uh, let's assemble Lady Reyna's massive die pool, because she is also fighting from horseback on a combat-trained steed. Three so we for fight. Got three for fighting. One for long sword. Plus one for long blades. And three for plus damage. three for animal handling. So you're rolling all that. You are keeping just the base three for fighting. Uh, but the good thing about this many bonus dice is like they should be all pretty high. Oh, God. And then don't forget to add one uh, because you're using castle forged weapons. Ash, I don't recall if you did that, but you would have hit by the same amount either way. So a 14 is enough for a second degree of success. It is not as impressive a roll as the rest of you, but an arrow did just kind of go whistling over her shoulder as she was racing down the thoroughfare to shoot this guy. Uh, Ash's, or rather Adam's shot, kind of threaded the needle and didn't hit either sister, but it might have thrown her aim off a little bit. She doesn't quite get the world ending 20 something uh, that some of the rest of you are rolling, but that is enough to finish this guy off because he also has an arrow sticking through his back. Uh, and we are going to call the session there uh, as you guys are panting and your horses are kind of high strung. Sandsteeds are full of energy. So they're kind of doing that like prancing sidelong in a circle thing. Uh, Oris has leapt down off the wagon like with the force of that swing. Uh, and is standing there with this, you know, bloody long axe, looking around through his shaggy mane of hair. Um, they're looking around, but you don't see any other threats. And the camera will turn and fade uh, down to the three corpses and the one quietly groaning in pain fellow that is now your prisoner which is where we are going to pick up in two weeks. So, congrats, everybody. 
we just oh wrapped God. up our pilot episode. We have wrapped up our first kind of training wheels combat of learning how it all falls together. Uh, and chat, everybody that was watching also survived. There was no heartbreak. Nobody was here as a ringer to, to die in the first session just to get that genuine George R. R. Martin vibe. <laughs> We didn't pluck your heartstrings by making you fall in love with young Adam uh, and then murdering him with a stray arrow at the start of the fight. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, everybody. Thank you for joining us, players. I hardly apologize for my multiple blue screens of death. Uh, we think it has been fixed. We've got a few weeks to hammer it out, and we will investigate my error messages more. So sorry for that kind of bump in the road. Um, but I hope everybody enjoyed their first taste of assembling die pools and how the dice work. Uh, this is kind of an easy fight by design, so you didn't really get to explore the destiny point mechanic yet, but they are going to be very important in coming weeks. In this fight, you guys are fighting a couple of bedraggled bandits that are ambushing you on the road. In coming weeks, you guys are going to be doing intrigues in King's Landing. Uh, very much against your superiors, or at least your peers. Um, so the destiny point mechanic, you guys are going to get to see it uh, definitely come into play a, a little bit more. Uh, I missed it in the chat because my computer is a hell machine. So who is currently sitting on the Iron Throne right now, everybody? Crimson I wasn't dude. able to keep on chat. Uh, who is it? Sorry, it's we got Crimson. Crimson something? dude. Crimson dude. I believe that is our boy James Myers, uh, I think. Uh, so whoever is currently sitting the Iron Throne, uh, make sure to hit me up. Um, if you can shoot me a PM over on Facebook or something, uh, or PM anyone else that you know here, and they will get you in touch with me. Uh, and we will figure out what noble house you want to give a boon to. And it does not need to be House Nymerian. Sure it does. Uh, remember that the throne is fickle. So it it's kind of any faction you want to give it to, uh, we'll get some sort of a leg up as we see you all back here again two weeks from now. Uh, and we're also going to see our, our final player Robert. as you all get to meet Robert, who is playing young Sir Lucaris Nymerian, who has been the one that has been hanging out in King's Landing for a time. So we will see you all in two weeks. Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. I apologize for the gremlins attacks, but I hope everybody had a good time. I know I did. Uh, welcome to Westeros, everybody. So let's see you in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.